This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. I just received confirmation of something pretty exciting. The great Camille Foster will be a guest speaker at the Renegade University Weekend in New Orleans that's happening next month. Many of you know Camille from his appearances on this podcast. He's also a producer at Freethink Media, and he's the host of my favorite political podcast, The Fifth Column. Camille, in my view, as many of you know, is one of the very best political commentators in the United States, in particular on the issue of race, which will be one of the subjects we will cover at the weekend in New Orleans. That's May 11th to May 13th. You can get more information and register for the weekend in New Orleans with Thaddeus Russell and now with Camille Foster as well at ThaddeusRussell.com slash courses. I've said many times in public that my major and primary intellectual influences were stand-up comedians like Richard Pryor, Mel Brooks, and George Carlin. In fact, I was thinking about the world differently because of comedians long before I ever read Marx or Foucault. And so I went out and found the leading expert on the history of comedians in the United States and in Canada. His name is Cliff Nesteroff. And while we did talk about the history of comedy, its meaning and how to interpret it, Cliff's backstory, where he's from, his childhood, revealed to me a whole chapter, a whole place in North American history that I had never known about that is one of the most inspiring stories I've ever heard. I love finding out about places and people like Cliff Nesteroff and the towns he grew up in. These are stories that aren't known, even by me, and that I want to make known. That's one of the reasons I love doing this podcast. This is my interview with Cliff Nesteroff. So I'm here with Cliff Nesterhoff, who's the author of a book called The Comedians, which is an encyclopedic history of American comedians going back to the early 20th century. And the narrative ends in the sort of 80s and 90s. And everything you need to know about every major, even not so major comedian in American history is in there. So, and you've also done a lot of projects for Vice and you've done podcasts with Mark Marin that also cover the history of American comedy. So, I mean, I think it's safe to say, and I know you've been called this, you're kind of like the leading expert, really, on the history of American comedy. I don't think there's any anybody who's even a close second. Is that fair to say? It's not up to me to decide. <laughs> it's a very arbitrary statement. I'll accept it. I'll take it. And I would also deny it if somebody said it in an accusatory fashion. Well, <laughs> have you or have, have you ever been a member? Um, well, is there any... There isn't much in the way of histories, uh, academic histories, or even semi-scholarly histories of comedy. Well, there's Is there? too many, I think, actually. Really? Yeah. But they're not I, good. Too, well, exactly. Yeah. You, don't, you don't want an academic or scholarly study of comedy ever. You want, hopefully, somebody who's uh, uh, either funny or has experience in the, the universe of stand-up or something like that who can give a proper perspective and undercurrent to a scholarly hmm. take, if that makes sense. So you think I could not write a good history of comedy? I would... Having never performed. I would say that there would have a uh, undercurrent missing to it that if a comedian read the book would be able to tell you had never done comedy. What's the, in, what's the undercurrent? I can't explain it, but comedians know it. Hmm. And I, it sounds really pompous to say, and I'm not the authority at all. I don't think, uh, you know, anybody could come along and certainly usurp that. But I just found like a niche that was perhaps not filled. But my book remains most popular with comedians, much mm. more so than the general public. It's mm. mostly comics who come up to me or write me 
or who were the biggest boosters of the book, which was great for marketing because I could, you know, ask Mel Brooks to blurb the book yeah. or get Mark Maron or Meryl Marco or all these people to sort of endorse it. So that was good for me when it came out and it was name dropped by people like Bill Burr or Norm MacDonald. But I think that's why. It's mm. because comedians read and they feel like this person uh, gets it. Gets it, yeah. I hope. I, that sounded like a huge ego trip just now. To well, say that, but. the thing is you really were a stand-up for a long time. You were a working stand-up yeah. comic for many years, right? Yeah, for eight years I did it, which yeah. in stand-up terms is really not that long, but it's long enough to understand what it is, how to build an act, what the road is like, what the triumphs and pitfalls are, you know, all of that. Sure. And you get a feel for it, feel for the backstage, the green room, the stage, the crowds, the clubs, the road, the motels, the free breakfast at Holiday Inn. Yeah, yeah. Right? I never got a free breakfast at the Holiday Inn. I, really? I, I played, I regularly played a Holiday Inn in Toronto which I lived in Toronto, so it wasn't like I was on the road. I thought that was the whole point of being a stand-up comedian, was to get the free breakfast at the, at the hotels you stay in on the road. Well, no, you dine and dash. So you don't get the free breakfast, you take oh, the free breakfast. right, because you're a bunch of losers and, who are broke. Bums, vagabonds. There's yeah. stories in my, books, uh, in my book of uh, comedians <laughs> from the 50s yeah. stuffing you know, ketchup packets into their pockets. You know, I was going to say, I mean, your book is... It's a history of bad people. I mean, everybody in the book is a bad person with all the meanings of bad, mm -hmm. right? So they are outcasts. They're literally criminals. They're drug addicts. They're drug dealers. They're saying things you're not supposed to say in public. They're getting arrested for that often. They're going to jail sometimes for it. They are vicious to one another. They're vicious to their families. They <laughs> are, I mean, right? It's just, it's just this litany of really tough people. But at the same time... They're also, I think, and you, I'm sure you would agree, radically changing this culture that we live in. And they are largely responsible for a lot of like the freedoms we have now, right? As, not just as comedians, but just in terms of what we can say now. Well, some of them, yeah, certainly, yeah. certainly. But, you know, the free speech movement wasn't called that at the time. But, you know, the world that we frame Lenny Bruce's trajectory in coincides with all the other censorship battles of the time, with the Howell trial, with, you know, your new publisher, Grove Press, mm. and Barney Ross was mm. fighting to get, you know, shitty books published in America, like Lady Chatterley's Lover. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody wanted to read it, but because it was banned, right. it had this great allure. And in going to the Supreme Court, fighting these battles, you know, uh, censorship laws were eroded. And Lenny Bruce and some of those comedians fall into that. I wouldn't say it's strictly just the comedians who gave us, you know, uh, free speech freedoms today, but it was part of the larger... Uh, culture of people that were bashing right. McCarthy's thoughts. But I mean, even the early vaudeville guys, you spent a lot of time in the book on yeah. the early vaudeville scene from the sort of early 20th century until like about the 30s. I guess it sort of peters out then. Um, but they're, they're saying stuff that you're not supposed to say in public, right? I mean, that's what they're doing and getting away with it. And so to me, kind of the one of the big arguments I make is that, that simply by doing that, they kind of like enlarge the sphere of acceptable discourse. Right, right, right. Okay, right. for everyone, right? Yeah, and so that's why, to me, they're heroes. Like, I, to me, stand, people get very are surprised when I say this, but, like, you know, because I'm an academic history professor, Ivy League, blah, 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 but to me, stand-up comedians have always been my number one heroes. I mean, they are responsible, really, for allowing me to do what I do because I write about people like that, and uh -huh. it would have been impossible, really, I think, without like the old vaudeville comics and Lenny Bruce and George Carlin and Richard Pryor and all the rest of them. So that's, uh, that's how important this is. I think, you know, what you're doing and what they did, but let's, let's go back before we do the book and talk about some history. Let's talk about your histories. Cause it's, sure. it's, it's just as interesting to me. You and I have a few things in common. We're about the same age. I think we're both from the West coast and we're both from places on the West Coast that are very, very weird within North American culture generally, associated with the left and the counterculture of the 60s. So where, where are you from specifically? Well, I didn't grow up on the coast. There was no water or ocean anywhere near where I grew up. I grew up in the woods in British Columbia. Yeah. But we were landlocked. We were about, I'd say, a good 10-hour car ride mm. from the ocean. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I grew up in a sort of a logging community. I was not raised by hippies, but I was influenced by hippies when I became a teenager 
because there were hippies who lived in the area where I lived. I lived in a very rural part of British Columbia, down a logging route. We lived on a road that was a, a dirt road. We got one television station. That was it. One radio station. At night, you would get hundreds of radio stations that would bounce through the through the mountains, and mm. that got me really into radio at a young age because mm. it was my only before the internet was my first exposure to like mass media where you could you know hear things broadcasting from Utah so, or Washington or California. When is this? I was born in 1980, and then, oh, we're not the same age. <laughs> You're born in 1980. I was born in 19. Okay, no, we're not the same age. Okay. Well, how old are you? I'm 52. Oh, yeah, that's not even close. I, to my I age. thought I heard you say that you grew up in the 80s. I mean, you grew up as a toddler in the 80s. Yes, literally. <laughs> okay. I thought you meant like came of age in the 80s. No, like I not did. at all. Not I at all. see. Okay. I came of age in the 1990s. I see. Okay, so you're listening to the radio in the late 80s and early 90s? Is that when it starts? <clears throat> well, r- right from the age of like five, I had like a little clock radio in my bedroom. And I go up and down that dial because I'd sa- it seemed so fascinating to me. I'd never been to the United States. I'd never been. We didn't travel, my family. So uh, I'd never been to the West Coast, even though... You know, a lot, you and many other people would assume that I'm from the West Coast. You know, you say British Columbia, which well, is where I'm from. People go, oh, Vancouver. Well, I mean, people from Bakersfield say they're from the West Coast. So, you know, I mean. Oh, well, they're wrong as well. <laughs> Good Lord. Okay. <laughs> um, but anyways, the area where I grew up. It's a West Coast province. How about that? It's a West Coast province. And the area where I grew up is where many draft dodgers from yes. America in the late 60s yes. ended up settling and remaining and raising their families. So my friends in school were mostly children of draft dodgers those were the hippie kids and then my family who were not draft dodgers were russian uh, pacifists on both sides of my family who had come to canada in the 1890s um because they were being conscripted alexander whatever the war was at the time they were going to be sent off to war and where i grew up in canada we had a few russian halls and they all have the same mural on the wall a painting from the 1890s of russian peasants throwing their government-issued rifles into a giant bonfire. And so this was a famous image as a child growing up. Any wedding or funeral that I attended was in one of these halls that had one of those uh, murals. Um, So it was an interesting confluence of people in this region. You had the draft dodger, hippie kids, and the hippie adults. And then the more conservative families who were Russian pacifists, which sounds radical, but in terms of their culture in Canada, they were the working class. They were the trade unionists. All my family worked at pulp mills. Yeah. Um, so that was my upbringing. So when I was 13, 14, 15, being raised in that, you want to rebel against that. I didn't become a warmonger as the rebellion. Instead, I gravitated towards the hippie kids and the hippie parents. And they're the people who provided me with my first taste of marijuana, my first taste of LSD. It came through them in really a very positive way. Like they would, the parents of the hippie kids would say, well, now you don't just take LSD and go to a party. This is like a spiritual a journey that you're going to go on. This is serious business for 12 hours. You want to do this in nature. Maybe you want to fast in advance. Maybe read this book. They gave me all the sort of grounding of how you should do psychedelics. And I followed that grounding. And it made me, um, it basically informed the rest of my life. Really, it did. Uh, My experiences with psychedelics were so powerful and so meaningful at the age of 16, 17, and 18 that from then on, Everybody thought I was 10 years older than I was. Every, everywhere I went. At the age of 18, hmm. people thought I was 30. And still going on today. <laughs> still going on today. But I think <laughs> if you use psychedelics properly, they can, hmm. it's not a verb, but they, they, they can sophisticate you in a way mm-hmm. that you have no right to be. You mm-hmm. know? And so yeah. I never finished high school because I was stupid. But psychedelics somehow made me circumvent my stupidity and made me find other avenues of intelligence that I had no right to possess, but that I tapped into them somehow, and I still am able to tap that reservoir somehow. People think sometimes that I'm smart, but people listening to this podcast can tell that I'm a raving fucking idiot, don't know anything, just got a big (laughs) ego, and that's it. So um, psychedelics really helped me in that way, but that all came out of where I grew up, was these draft dodgers who still subscribe to the 60s ideal of... Uh, communes and and macrobiotic diets and all these things that had been uh, passe by that point of the 90s were still kind of vibrant there. But my parents did not subscribe to that. And they were very uh, uh, appalled and disgusted by hippies the way I guess most people tend to be. So uh, that was different. But they were pacifists, working class. 
And it was just a strange confluence. We grew up in the woods in a very isolated area, 80, 80 kids in my elementary school, 400 kids in my high school, which was 7th through 12th grade, and then made my way through the 11th grade and then got uh, kicked out. But uh, that was basically where I was uh, weaned. Wow. So kicked out for what? I ran for school president in the 11th <laughs> grade. <clears throat> On a uh, pro-war platform? Or? Pro-war, pro-psychedelic <laughs> platform. No, I, uh, I had read a book, a biography of Stan Freeberg when uh-huh. I was 17. Who's Stan school. Freeberg? Stan Freeberg was a satirist in the 1950s who was one of these guys that you're kind of referring, who made everything possible after the fact, mm. shook things up. Yeah. He had a network radio show on CBS in the late 1950s in an era where they were no longer making network radio shows. Mm-hmm. Everybody went to TV and radio kind of fell apart commercially. They salvaged themselves by switching from scripted programming to rock and roll disc jockeys. The Alan Freed era sort of saved radio, but it was just people playing records, playing rock and roll, playing music. There was no longer <clears throat> no longer the contingent of we're going to put on a show like the Jack Benny program. That had died. But for whatever reason, Stan Freeberg got a gig with CBS doing a scripted radio show. He had had a series of hit records for Capitol Records, novelty records that satired, or satirized um, popular trends of the day, Dragnet, he did a parody of that was popular. So they gave him his own network radio show. But nobody was really paying attention to what he was doing because everybody was focused on television. So he did some really incendiary, insightful, brilliant satire Hmm. in the late 50s. He did a bit that satirized the gaudiness of Las Vegas. And it was about uh, Las Vegas imported the Gaza Strip and and put on a big show of fighting and and a kick line of chorus girls called Do the Gaza Strip. Um, And then the big headliner that night was the atomic bomb. They set off the bomb on stage and everybody dies. This was a radio program on CBS in 1957, that's a comedy show that Stan Freeberg did. He was also uh, without a sponsor for a while because he got an offer, I guess, from uh, Philip Morris or whoever made Lucky Strike Cigarettes. Maybe American Tobacco Company wanted to sponsor the show. And he said, no, I don't want to advertise cigarettes on my show. Uh, yeah. This, so, I, OK, this, I'm skipping ahead, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's fine. Yeah. You're reminding me of a lot of stuff in your book, in particular of the comics in the 40s and 50s who are doing really subversive stuff for that time in particular meaning like subversive of the military ethos of the country, putting out shows like I'm thinking of um, the Bilko, the Sergeant Bilko show, Phil Silvers, right? Which is basically it's presenting GIs as these lazy layabouts who do everything (laughs) to shirk labor and service in the military. That's that's what the show is about, right? And it's white guys too, right? It's, It's white GIs who are just shirking all the time. They're just completely shiftless. Yeah. This is in the 50s. Conniving, this is lying. After World gambling. War II, this is during and after the Korean War. This is during the Cold War. This is when you've got to be a disciplined American citizen mm-hmm. to beat off this, the commies, right? Really subversive. And then this, you know. The U.S. military released uh, uh, some sort of condemnation after the first season yeah. of, of the Phil Silver show saying it is a bad example. It is degrading our military. Uh, President Truman... Uh, uh, no, sorry, President Eisenhower. Uh, Eisenhower should do something about it. Yeah, I don't even think that part's in my book. I think I cut it out. But yeah. uh, you can find the memo that was fired off and the press release that was sent to the press that said that Sergeant Bil- Bilko uh, denigrates the uh, the U.S. military and it should be you know canceled. And you don't you don't cover this in the book, I don't think, but it only lasted about four or five years, right? The show. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I wonder four, if that had anything to do with it. I don't know. I th- most shows in that era didn't last that long. Okay. And it's amazing how many of those shows we think lasted forever that only ran maybe one or two seasons and yeah. then ran in syndication right. uh, forever. So Bilko is one of those. Five seasons is a healthy run in the 1950s for any okay. show. It's a healthy run even today. But yeah. um, I don't know that that was the reason. I think the reason was that uh, Nat Hyken, who created the show, left. He was burnt out. He had passed the reins over to other writers like uh, Aaron Rubin, who later became one of the main guys behind the Andy Griffith show in the early 60s. A lot of the people that worked on Bilko and the Sid Caesar program in the 50s, that contingent of writers and showrunners would then basically control American show business and television comedy anyways in the 60s. And you say in the book that those guys pretty much all were veterans 
basically, or they were basically of the the World War II oh, generation. Sure. They were either they either served in the military or they more often performed right in lot, the military. A lot of comedians got their start as performers during World War II. Yeah. you know, most people. I shouldn't say most. I don't know, but most people that I know, if sure. they were drafted, they would immediately try and get a special services gig where they're doing like well, a stage show instead of being armed with a gun. Oh, well, but you're from, you know, a place where they do that kind of thing. Real Americans don't do that. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Comedians are not real Americans <laughs> in a way, right? Well, it's a very, we're all on Americans here. Well, it, it, seriously. I mean, that is in a sense, I think, the history of comedians, isn't it? Them not being truly American the way you're supposed to be in the time. Subversion is the yeah. current that runs through great comedy. Yeah. You know, not all comedians are subversive. And those are the comedians oh, that true. Um, are not the ones that necessarily stand the test of time. They are usually the ones that are the most popular. But they're not necessarily the ones that we look at as the heroes decades later. Right. Exactly. The subversives are the ones that we look to as like, they changed the world, whether that's right or not. Right. We look at the Lenny Bruce's, the George Carlin's, the Richard Pryor's as the as the wants. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're right. They're the ones that are the, mm-hmm. not the... I want to go back, though, to your story because I just want to... Yes. Minute, I just want to bask in this image <clears throat> of... This town, where is it, first of all, the town you grew up in? There's no town. There's no town. In the woods. What's the nearest town? Uh, the nearest town was, well, there's two towns equal distance. One was the hippie town, Nelson, British Columbia, which is still a hippie town. Oh, Nelson, yeah. And then in the other direction, the town where I was born, it's called Castlegar, British Columbia, which was the Russian, <clears throat> that was the dichotomy. The ca- Castlegar was the Russian pacifist mm-hmm. working class town. Everybody worked at the mill or at the smelter, including all my grandparents. And then Nelson was the hippie town, which was the where the draft dodgers kind of settled. And, and still to this day, it is um, one of those cliche towns that you find in Oregon or Washington, except more so because it's Canada. Um, so You know, I've never been to one of those towns. I live in Oregon now, but it's Salem, where I live, is not one of those towns. And I've never been to one of those Canadian draft dodger towns. It never occurred to me that there would be whole towns with whole cultures built from that. Yeah, well, the town existed before that, but it quickly became yeah. that. And the huh. weird thing is they're so close together. They're both small towns with a population of 8,000 people. They're less than an hour apart. Nobody from Castlegar ever visits Nelson. Nobody from Nelson ever visits Castlegar because it's, there's a snobbery. The hippies hate yeah. the rednecks and the rednecks hate the hippies. Right. And I was raised in the middle of those two uh, uh, aspects. And so I was pulled in both directions. And still to this day... I, you know, I don't define myself politically in any way because I, I'm pulled in, in both directions depending on the, the circumstance. So when you say working class pacifists, I get an erection. I mean, that's like my dream. Then you just never see it in this country, right? And we haven't in a long, long time. I mean, working class people who are that committed mm-hmm. um, to the anti-war cause, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, well, b- yeah, both my grandparents were in prison during World War II. Holy crap. Oh, oh during World War II, they refused. Well, the, the lineage refused every war. Every yeah, war. but World War II was the big one to do. I mean, that was really yeah, that was really going out. My there. grandpa Nestroff and my grandpa Arshin both wow. uh, spent World War II in prison. Um, and because of this, their yeah. religion, this pacifist Russian religion, was considered like this alien enemy religion. So this is way before my time. But in the early fifties, the most hardened pacifist families, the ones who refused to pay taxes because they believed it was bolstering the war machine, which wasn't my immediate family. My immediate family did pay taxes because they didn't want to go to jail. But the more hardened elements of our culture, because they refused to pay taxes and were such hardened pacifists in the early 50s, their children were taken away from them and put into camps. Jesus Christ. In the interior of British Columbia. And so that was a big thing. So they were treated very similar to the native people in Canada in that regard. Wow. Okay. Was this your family this happened to? Uh, well, not my family specifically, but yeah. within our culture, yeah. you know, only maybe 1,500 people came from Russia. Mm-hmm. So I'm sort of related to everybody, no matter right. what, even if I'm not related Everybody's to an off. Everybody's an off. Yeah. yeah. I grew up on Osachoff Road. My principal was Mr. Lukov in my elementary school. And Mrs. Plotnikov was my teacher. Danny Chernenkoff, Adam Chernenkoff, Chris Kalmakoff were all in my class, Cliff Nestroff sitting in his desk. And then I always feel I should contact this woman. I always make a joke about her. But across the aisle for me in my elementary school was a girl named Lena Shurstabidoff, who had it worse than anybody in that class. Huh. Now, were these, were these pacifists first or were they communists? Who were they weren't communists at all. Okay. They were pacifists. Yeah. They believed in God and they believed that killing another person was the greatest sin 
no matter what the circumstance, whether it's for self-defense, whether it's uh, uh, for war, they felt that there was no greater sin than killing another uh, living human being in the name of anything. So for that reason, um, they were both pacifists and uh, religious. So they weren't communists. Yeah. It was also pre, uh, pre-communist pre in terms of that becoming the prevailing uh, feeling or theory in Russia. So yeah, they were from Russia, but they were right. they predated all of that. They're pre-Bolshevik. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I mean, but they were in Canada after the revolution. What did they think of it? What did they think of the Soviet Union? Uh, well, they were persecuted in Russia prior to the Soviet Union. Then they get to Canada, they're persecuted by the Canadian government. So I doubt very much that they were in favor of Sovietism because they had such a distrust of all government. At the same time, I'm sure they sympathized with uh, people that were red baited because the way they were treated by the Canadian government, people that were communists, was not dissimilar to the way the Canadian government was treating sure. my people. So my grandmother never spoke of any communist leaders. Uh, my uncle got into it when he was studying Russia. And in our elementary school, I never got to do this. I think the sixth grade or the seventh grade, if you took Russian as your second language, in my school, where I grew up, you could take French or you could take Russian. There was no Spanish. There was just so many Russian kids around that you could take <laughs> Russian as a second language. Mm-hmm. Um, so I learned to read Russian as a, as a child. Um, but they, I lost my train of thought. What was I? Oh, did your grandmother talking about oh, my gra- yeah, the my, Soviets? In elementary school, you could take a trip or, to Russia. You say your grandfather got into it. My well, uncle, uncle got, got into, into it. it with someone. Yeah. But he, my uncle traveled to Russia and we had the option... You had to raise money, like do like uh, uh, bake sales and stuff to raise money for it. But all the kids from the Russian class could do a trip to Russia for a week. That was part of the deal. So that was communist mm-hmm. Russia at the time. Um, so there may have been like a, some sort of understanding or allegiance. But I think it was more just a matter of peace and fellowship as yep. opposed to like supporting communism. It was the opposite. It was like we should not be bombing. Yeah communists or anybody yeah believe it or not there really were peace activists who did that kind of thing who really weren't pro-soviet you know that's, yeah. that was my family you know? yeah. yeah we were is sort of it was either called the peace movement or or the detente movement right just just calling for detente because it's yeah. good for humanity not to be having nuclear yeah, yeah. bombs dropped on people mm-hmm. in the 80s all my family was involved in that like disarmament uh, yeah. um, campaigns and yeah. and meeting at the the united nations they would usually sing a song at the united nations because my uh, lineage still to this day have traditional choral songs. They do a cappella choirs. Every funeral that I attend has old ladies with those bambushkas yeah. singing these songs. I don't know how they know them off the top of their head. They're not written down. They're not, huh. you know, something that you, I mean, you do learn them, but um, anyways. So w- Russian Orthodox, is that the Christianity? Dukaborism. What's that? Dukaborism is a strain of Russian pacifism. Huh. Um, the but, slogan is peace and toil life. But it's Christian, though. I guess there's no Bible and there's no church. They don't believe in the church. My family believe that if you look at the Bible and it talks about false idols and false idolship, a man-made church is fa- false idolship. And so is that preacher. Because that's not God. So they're definitely not Russian Orthodox then, yeah. God doesn't exist because a man built a building. God exists at all times everywhere. That was their philosophy. So the most extreme strain of Dukaborism, these are the people that didn't pay taxes, who my parents rolled their eyes at and didn't really believe in, they would strip nude and and burn down churches. They were arsonists. And (laughs) the last of the the arsonists... What what was the thing about taking off your clothes? It was just like a symbolic attention-getting protest move. I love it. You know, it. if you're a protester, if you're an agitator, you learn very quickly, how do we get the attention of the media yeah. so people know about our cause? So for the Duke of Boers, stripping nude and lighting something on fire was maybe the greatest marketing campaign in terms of getting attention. It was also, this also happens often in protest campaigns, the worst thing they could have possibly done because it brought down the hammer and the thumb of the government on Mm -hmm. them. Look at these radicals. Look at these anarchists. They're burning things. They're nude. They're clearly insane. We need to take their children away from them and put them in camps. So it was kind of a a double-edged thing. But Dukaborism was the religion. My God. And to this day, there's maybe 20,000 people who still remain in the religion. And your parents are members of it. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Still. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, my dad's not well. And the way it works, of course, with any generation, you become more and more westernized as each generation um, continues. So there's people with last names like mine who now do serve in the Canadian military, although that would be completely unacceptable in my family. Like if I went and did something for the military, U.S., Canadian, whatever, like my family would be appalled, disgusted, heartbroken. My grandma, I remember my grandma sitting me down. I'd be at her house watching TV and there'd be like an ad for the army would come on, be all you can be. And I remember my mom, sorry, my grandma turning the volume off and sitting me down and saying, don't ever believe them. Whatever they tell you about the military, heroic uh, glory, it's all lies. They lie to young people to send them off to die. Don't believe the military. There's my grandma, who was like the sweet little old lady who just God. makes soup. But that was the prevailing uh, attitude and understanding. And still, still to this day, I feel that way. I don't talk about it a lot because in the United States, you can't. It's the biggest taboo. When people ask me, like, they say, oh, you can't say anything in comedy anymore. I say, oh, you pretty much say everything in comedy to this day, despite the hysteria that's out there, despite the hysteria of Twitter. You can still go on stage in any comedy club and say whatever you want. You really can. One exception. That's right. That's right. One exception is criticizing the U.S. military or their policies. Correct. If you do that, then you're the scum of the earth. So I don't talk about it that much, but... You know, I have no faith whatsoever in U.S. foreign policy or what it does. And I feel sorry for people that enlist thinking it's a noble cause. But often um, you've been lied to. So I asked you to be on this show not knowing any of that. <laughs> this was just going to be about comedians. Yeah, let's get and back to Shek No, Green. this is at least as good. I mean, this is amazing. Let's I, talk about Myron Cohen. I want to move. Yeah, we'll get to that. I want to move to that town now. And I want to meet everybody. That is so incredible. I didn't even know this existed. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah. The Duke of Boers of Castle Garden. And working Virginia. class, that's the best part because my whole world has been, sure, I've been around, my girlfriend's a pacifist, you know, I've been around anti-war activists my entire life, but they've all been middle class, basically rich kids, you know, American rich kids um, who went to fancy colleges. That's not these people. So no. what did they, which metal was being smelted? In the smelter where they worked? Um, my grandpa worked at a zinc smelter yeah. in Trail, British Columbia, which is a famous uh, uh, factory smelter in Canada because, or it used to be, because it was always rife with labor issues, strikes, yeah. all kinds of stuff like that. Um, there was also a number of, of short films made about it because it was a great microcosm of a labor strife. Um, mm -hmm. And then it was close to the Columbia River. And they frequently were in trouble for polluting the river, the, mm -hmm. the smelter there, right. Kaminko, they were called, to the extent that the U.S. government sued them. You would think that if anybody, you know it's bad if the U.S. government is suing. Like under Jimmy Carter, maybe? A company for pollution. <laughs> yeah. uh, for decades, it was in, like hmm. it went through subsequent administrations because of this. Hmm. Right over the border in Washington, all kinds of stuff was washing up on the shore. Right. And, Anyways, so my grandpa worked at that zinc smelter. And then there was another smelter in Castlegar that was a cellophane smelter. God, it smelled Jesus. bad. It smelled worse than anything. Just smokestacks of whatever is created or disposed of when you process cellophane. And most of my uncles uh, worked there. Oh. Some of them still did right up until very recently. Um, but that whole factory mold just like here has gone the way of the dodo bird with more and more layoffs. And as the industry has sure. changed that, um, you know, now if you go on strike, they'll just fire everybody and then bring in some, you know, people I, at minimum wage. I can't even imagine the stories. I mean, the, has anyone written a history of that? My brother is a historian uh -huh. of that culture. Yeah. Okay. It needs it. Yeah. Is he a professional? Is he an academic? Yeah. My brother, Greg Nestroff, he will, he lives in that same small area. So there's only so much work, that you can do to make a living in a town oh. of 8,000 people. So he's a small town newsman. Oh. He writes for the local paper, goes on the local radio, but he is the historian of that okay. area and of the, the Duke of Boros. He is the guy. But no books published by uh, anyone? They're like vanity pressings. So uh -huh. you can go online and okay. definitely find books, but they're not like going to be from a major publisher. It'll be from a local press. Yeah, someone needs to get into that town with your brother and do a whole bunch of interviews and do it right. Like that's, I can see all kinds of things coming out of that bunch of story. I mean, that's an amazing thing. That's an amazing setting to live in. I mean, I always sort of 
bragging away about my radical childhood, mm-hmm. but you've got me beat, man. That's well, amazing. Well, it's, it's, it gives, it's given me a very interesting perspective in life and to live in the United States. And when I see this weird dichotomy, the red state, blue state thing here, to me, it just seems like such nonsense. But there's such snobbery on both sides of that argument that drives me nuts. It's like, it drives me crazy when I listen to people who were never raised in a small town or do not come from a small area yeah. who are experts on small right. town people or small town areas. Yeah. My parents would define themselves as apolitical. And based on what I'm saying, it sounds like they're not. And they aren't. But a lot of people don't think of themselves as political. Sure. They just think of what's right, what's wrong yeah. for their family. I get it. So they were trade unionists laborists Mm -hmm. they believed in in striking for better wages or striking for better conditions or protesting against what the company was doing to them they believed in being anti-war and yet they believed they were conservative apolitical people and really they were as long as nobody's trying to define them yeah like socially culturally how were they i'm betting they were not they weren't hippies right they weren't counter they weren't hippies at all but it was not even a, a thought my parents have never used the phrase left wing and they've never used the phrase right wing. You know, it just doesn't enter their consciousness. Right, but they weren't smoking weed with you. They were very opposed to marijuana. Right. They were very opposed to marijuana because they were conditioned the same way anybody is by the media that it's going to lead to, to murder. If you smoke a joint, then maybe you will join the military and pick up a gun. You know, that oh, was really? That. <laughs> it's, a, it's a gateway to <laughs> military service? I've never heard that one. <laughs> Uh, so they were opposed to all of that. Uh, I had to discover that stuff on, on my own. But it was interesting how doing psychedelics, smoking pot, gave me a bit. bit while well, I did those things to rebel, at the same time in doing so, they made me more appreciative of my culture and what they stood for. You know, psychedelics can change the perspective and so can pot. When you're first starting to smoke it, it helps you see through the bullshit a uh-huh. little bit, you know. Yeah. And so I was able to see through the bullshit, but also suddenly see the value in the things that I had been rejecting because I had been raised among them. So, you know, I mean, we're all a confluence of our respective influences, and I certainly am with my. So I've never done LSD. I did mushrooms once. It was the worst night of my life because I didn't have someone to guide me through it like the people around you, apparently. Um, smoked a lot of weed, though. And I think that one of the – how does this sound to you? Uh, psychedelics, maybe drugs in general, but certainly psychedelics – cause one to disassociate from one's individual identity so that they can see themselves differently. Is well, right? the, the easy... I could Is that how it, it feels to you, at least? <laughs> well, not in those terms. Okay. I know what you're getting at. Mm-hmm. I mean, what we call it in psychedelics is just ego dissolution, mm-hmm. where you yeah. lose your ego. Right. So that's the same thing that you're saying, I think, in the most simple, Sounds right. simple mm-hmm. of terms. And that is one of the qualities of psychedelics. Like, if you read... The charts written by the the real doctors who've worked with and studied LSD in a therapeutic setting starting in the 50s through to today. People like Dr. Stanislav Grof, who's still alive, very famous uh, at the time, Czechoslovakian. Now I guess he's in the Czech Republic. Doctor who started in the 50s, still alive, who wrote all these books that really explain what you will experience over the course of your trip. What hour one will be like, hour three, hour five, hour seven, hour nine, twelve, what it's going to feel like at each point what kind of matter is going to bubble to the surface from your subconscious, what kind of um, uh, negative things might happen that you might have to navigate very clearly. And one of the things that they talk about is ego dissolution around uh, hour three, four, five, six of a typically high LSD dose, usually 350 micrograms, which is a major dose, you will lose your ego. You'll lose your sense of self. And it's that's the point where most people start to panic when you hear about acid yeah. freakouts. It was somebody who that was, was not me. prepared. For that was this. me on mushrooms at hour two. Yeah. yeah. You, if, you're, if you're not anticipating the fact you're going to lose your ego, you're going to fight it and try and hold on to it. And that's right. when you have a bad trip. Interesting. But if you have a guide with you who says, go with it, yeah. just let go, just let go. That's when you start to ascend to the heights of profound. Uh, it's about letting go, isn't mm-hmm, it? Mm-hmm. Yep. But... Uh, Anyways, ego dissolution is a major part of the psychedelic trip that is scientifically documented. It's not an illusion. It's something that happens over the course of the trip. And when your ego defenses vanish, that's when you are open to new ideas Mm -hmm. and new ways of meaning and understanding and acknowledging your own shortcomings, the humility that comes with psychedelics. Um, It's really good uh, if you're a narcissist to take mm. LSD and to lose that ego, it'll yes. give you a perspective that a narcissist doesn't allow to look at themselves and how they 
interact negatively with so many people in their lives. Yeah, perspective was the word I was searching for. It gives you a new perspective, right? Yes. You, you are outside of yourself and you're outside of your relationships with other people, right? Precisely. And now you can look at them at least differently. You Maybe, can, it's it, essentially, you know, without getting too uh, uh, new agey about it, it's almost like an out-of-body experience where you step out of your own mind and then look at it and go, shit, yeah. that's what I look like to the world. That, there you go. That's how I act. And you'll come out of it with a greater understanding of uh, hopefully less ego, more humility, more patience, more tolerance, and less concern for the bullshit of your daily life. It kind of reprioritizes for a lot of people what is important and what's unimportant. So a lot of career-minded people who are obsessed with their career after a major psychedelic dose will often realize their career is not necessarily the most important thing and they start to focus more on any number of things. Maybe altruism, maybe their family, maybe animals, maybe art. Things that are not necessarily um, beholden to the punch card and to ambition. Yeah. So I smoked weed every day for about two years when I was 18 and 19 years old. Loved it. And then I did the mushrooms and had a terrible experience. And then the weed started to give me paranoia. And I would get the self-consciousness that you're talking about. Oh, my God, is that what I look like to other people? And I would panic. And it was terrible. And I kept trying to get that back. I kept trying Mm -hmm. to smoke weed. I was hoping I would get that feeling back. I tried for the next 25 years to do that. It never worked until now. So now, because in Oregon we have recreational marijuana that's legal, there's a dispensary that is just blocks from my house. And you can dose... To, right. the, to the milligram, exactly what you need to get the right kind of high. Yeah. And my God, Cliff, I've rediscovered the joy of when I was 18 and 19. And I don't get really high. I don't get super high, but I get high in a way that does all the things that I yeah. used to love and that you're talking about. And I'm wondering, you know, when I turned 19 is also when I became really career oriented. Between 19 and this year, I've basically been just grinding constantly trying to move up and advance my career in all these different ways, just constantly going up, 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 up. And I wonder if that's why I had a hard time looking at myself. Well, psychedelics will teach you that. Um, There's nothing wrong with working or wanting to create things, but you have to uh, acknowledge that doing them is the important part. It sounds like a flaky thing. You know, when people say it's not the, it's not the destination, it's the journey, but It's true, though. (laughs) You have to be happy doing what you're doing right now because whatever you accomplish in the future, you'll be very unhappy with if you didn't figure out that this is what it's about because you'll never be satisfied. That's the problem with with the whole theory of ambition is you're always striving for the next thing. It means you're never going to be satisfied with anything you're ever doing, no matter how accomplished it is. You win an Oscar... Well, why didn't you win all? Why didn't you win three Oscars? Yep. Or why don't you win another Oscar? Now I have to win, you know, yeah. whatever. It's like it's endless, and it's sort of just selling ourselves short because you're not able to enjoy anything. Just yeah, just look at the careers, the subsequent lives of everyone who's won Best Actor or Best Actress, right? I mean, it's not a pretty picture. You know, it's constantly. Well, it could be a pretty picture if you're satisfied with your life. Not really. You know, I mean, it's yeah. not a pretty picture if you. Have dissatisfied. I'm just talking about what we know about those people, right? The stars, the great Hollywood stars, their lives generally don't end up all that great. I mean, it's well, pretty it's common. Well, probably, this is all just my own theory and conjecture, but I think that if you're not, if you're allowing your happiness to be defined by external factors, that's exactly. the problem. So if you want an Oscar, if I want an Oscar, I would be like, well, I'm done. I can retire. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right. what an accomplishment. I don't need to do anything else now for the rest of my life yep. because look at this. I won the Oscar. Yep. You know, that would be my attitude. Me too. Um, but for a lot of people, if you define yourselves based on how Hollywood defines you as like a hot flavor of the month and then you're not a hot flavor of the month, of course, you're going to be miserable. Yeah. But if you are in charge of your own yeah. Definition: How you define success, then uh, you'll be a lot better off. Who got you the LSD in the woods? In the woods, um, it was the '90s. So you usually got your drugs at uh, what they called in those days a rave. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. You're and my you're my second rave kid to be. I, Moshe Kasher was on the show. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, I was we, never. We talked a lot about that. Yeah. I was not a, a rave kid per se, but when you grew up in the woods your opportunities for any social interaction or um, event are very limited. So there were no like bar. I was too young to drink anyways, but there's no bars to go to. Uh, There were punk gigs occasionally that would come through some weird area. 
And, you know, living in Los Angeles, if somebody will say, there's a punk gig on Friday, do you want to go? You'll ask, well, who is it? Who's playing? But where I grew up, there's a punk gig on Friday. You're going to go, yeah, of course. Of course. Who's playing? You, sure. find, you find out later, you're going to go no matter what. Yeah. So the raves were sort of the same thing. It was like, everybody's going to be out in the woods listening to techno music. Mm -hmm. So you're going to go. So you'd find like the rednecks in the parking lot drinking beer with a bonfire, not going inside. And then inside you had kids with pacifiers and candy necklaces and whatever. So I was never a fan of the music per se. I was a fan of records and the DJs always had like collections of records they flipped through. So I got my LSD initially from that environment. I don't remember from who or how a friend of mine, I'm sure. Um, but that was my entrance into it. And now I would recommend n- nobody do that because I don't believe in doing psychedelics in a random environment mm. with a lot of people you right. don't know. Oh, yeah. It can go great. And for me, I had only positive experiences, but I know now, know now that there's a 50% chance I could go awry. Right. And if you have a bad trip in psychedelics, there's a reason. Yeah. It wasn't an accident and it wasn't because you had bad acid. It was because of the set and setting. That's mm. what they call it in psychedelic mm-hmm. therapy. The set and setting. Where are you and who are you with? Yep. For 12 hours, you have to have a game plan, beginning to end. Where are you going to be? Where are you going to end up? You don't want to be riding public transit in Los Angeles when you're high on acid. That's yeah. a bad trip. Yeah. I was in a pitch, pitch black room and someone reached out their hand and said, here, hold out, hold out your hand. And I held out my hand and I, he dropped a bunch of mushrooms in my hand. I said, just eat it. I said, okay. Pitch dark room, ate the mushrooms, and then it was not a good trip. Yeah. Yeah. Because they just sort of left me. And then I walked away yeah, that's by myself, fine. wandering the streets when I was 19 years old. So God bless raves. God bless rave culture. Yeah, when I was talking to Moshe about this, I, it really, I mean, I knew I was sort of, I was always sympathetic to it. I never knew it that well because I was older, as so I missed it. But when he t- told me about his experiences, I realized just how fantastic it was from my point of view, that whole culture, you know, in the 90s, just, I think it was super, I just... It was so liberatory and so renegade um, at the time. Well, the hippie, you're, you're the, another example. The, of this. the hippie kids got into it a big way. So sure. the raves that I was attending, it was all those children of the draft dodgers. So awesome. they, <laughs> you know, they they influenced that realm. For me, it was my first entrance into any kind of social anything, where I was interacting with large amounts of people in one evening. Because where we grew up on the dirt road, it was very isolated. You know, my school was nearby, but after school, it was just me and my family. I didn't interact with people because there was nobody around. You had no neighbors. We had some neighbors, but um, it was very small. Yeah. You know, you you knew when somebody moved into the neighborhood or moved out of the neighborhood. How big was your family? My brother, my mom, and my dad. Oh, wow. So there's the four of you in the house most Mm -hmm. of the time, Mm -hmm. especially in the winter. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So very isolated. Yeah. I mean, you don't think of it as isolation at the time Mm. at all. But now it's funny because I think of myself as like a television historian, comedy historian, media historian, and I'm really into that stuff. And I had no access to any of it growing up. You know, I watched yeah. everything that was on our TV, but it was just CBC and that was it. I had no access to anything else. And I think maybe that's why I got into that stuff because I became so curious as I was deprived. I never saw Saturday Night Live or David Letterman, but I would see them parodied in Mad Magazine. You know, I'd buy Mad Magazine at the corner store and read all the movie parodies and TV parodies and political references without any point of reference for myself. And I learned who Ronald Reagan was. I learned what an officer and a gentleman was because I'm reading an officer and a Gentile in Mad Magazine. (laughs) Uh So I became so curious that when I finally did have access to all that kind of stuff when I moved to Toronto when I was 18. I had exactly the same experience. I went crazy. I was in movie theaters, rep cinemas, video stores, libraries, all the time and just absorbing everything because I didn't want to miss out the way I had missed out, you know, for the inception of my childhood. But in in doing so, it gave me such a wonderful, uh, unique perspective. And I think you'll find in comedy especially, a lot of people come from small towns or abnormal circumstances. Hmm. Hmm. The the prevailing attitude is that comedians come from hard childhoods or broken homes. I don't Hmm. believe that's true. I believe they come from abnormal circumstances which often includes broken homes Mm -hmm. but just as often is not a broken home but just a weird place to be raised maybe you're the youngest of 18 children or maybe you grew up on a farm or maybe you grew up where i grew up with no access to media and i think that gives people a unique perspective when they're airdropped into a big city like toronto or new york and they see how absurd everything (laughs) is where people that have lived in new york their whole life to them it's normal yeah you know what i mean yeah yeah it's an outsider perspective Mm -hmm. you have built into you 
wherever you go. Yeah. Because there is no place on earth, especially in your case, there's no place on earth like where you come from. There is no place on earth, right? I mean, that is unique. I mean, um, so thank God for punk rock. That was one portal for you. Big time, yeah. And then thank God for rave. That was another portal. <laughs> That's right. The rave portal brought and, me drugs and, and the punk portal brought me politics. And then there was another very important portal, which I haven't mentioned yet, which was the gas station, right? Yeah. Well, where I bought my Mad Magazines was a gas station. And didn't you also get VHS tapes Yes, there? yes, yeah. yes. It was one of those classic gas stations with the pyramid display where there's VHS tapes on one side of the pyramid and beta tapes on the other side of the, of the the display and that was where we would rent movies and you were at the at mercy of the gas station whatever videos they supplied or what you saw so every now and then there'd be an oddball movie in there and uh, 1994 pulp fiction was one of the biggest movies of the year and so pulp fiction was readily available at the gas station one of the other movies that they had the same week as a new release was ed wood mm-hmm. and so um, i was 14 when both of those movies came out, I rented both of those movies the same weekend, watched Pulp Fiction, watched Ed Wood, and both of them made me absolutely fascinated and curious with the films that inspired them. So Pulp Fiction was clearly inspired by 70s action stuff. And Ed Wood was clearly inspired by, or was about, 50s black and white sci-fi B-movies. So I wanted to fish out all the influences of those movies, and I eventually did. Nelson, British Columbia, that hippie town, had a video store called Rio's Videos, which was like this unbelievable anomaly. I don't know who Rio was, like where he came from, but he obviously came from some urban place and brought his knowledge (laughs) to the woods because they had uh, something like 50,000 VHS tapes. There's only 8,000 people in the town. (laughs) The store had 50,000 VHS tapes, and they would have stuff like Ed Wood's Glen or Glenda on VHS, but four copies for no reason, you know? <laughs> um, and so I started going there and sussing out all the seventies action movies, seventies crime movies, seventy new wave mm, cinema, black exploitation, black exploitation. Yeah. I still remember the first one I rented was called black. Eye. Hmm. It starred Fred Williamson. It was a Warner brothers movie from 73. I don't know that one. Dire- it's very obscure for yeah. some reason, directed by a guy named Jack Arnold, huh. Jack Arnold in the fifties directed all the sci-fi movies, a weird connection, tarantula creature from the black lagoon, the mole people, the space children, mm-hmm. monster on the campus, the incredible shrinking man. That was Jack Arnold in the seventies. He made black eye, this black exploitation movie. Huh. And then I rented hell up in Harlem directed by Larry Cohen and yeah. also starred Fred Williamson. Great soundtrack by Edwin Starr from Motown. And I was getting into music at the time. So the LSD kind of taught me that everything was connected. So here I rented this black exploitation movie because of Pulp Fiction. Turns out the black exploitation movie is directed by this guy, Jack Arnold, who made all the 50s sci-fi black and white monster movies. I just watched Ed Wood. I'm getting into that. So everything's kind of... Your portal is so small, but you're making so much of it, mm-hmm. of, the, yeah. of the water that seeps in. Because you know. of the acid, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I believe you. God bless LSD. I love drugs. People should do drugs. I mean that. People should do more drugs. Well, the one thing that I find most remarkable about psychedelics is that uh, when done properly, again, yeah. under the, the, the formats that have been designed by many experienced LSD therapists, is that they can, it can cure addiction. So if you're addicted to heroin, uh, ayahuasca treatments now are helping to cure, hmm. and break the cycle of addiction. John Hopkins University just finished a five-year pilot study administering psilocybin to cure nicotine addiction successfully. Mm. And in the 50s, the whole reason LSD was put on the market legally was to treat alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And it did successfully. It had some outrageous 75% to 80% success rate um, where Mm. people who were never able to quit drinking either were able to quit drinking forever or further down the scale, less successfully, were able to quit drinking completely for just one year Mm -hmm. or quit didn't quit drinking but drank considerably less than they ever had before so in every category there was a success story in the 50s but all that research was thrown out the window and locked up once it was made illegal and and then treated as if it wasn't valid hmm. but it was completely valid and still remains valid so yeah. uh that for me i don't think people should do more drugs myself but <laughs> why not if you, if you do have a cocaine <laughs> addiction or a heroin addiction or a prescription painkiller addiction LSD, psilocybin, peyote, ayahuasca can all successfully treat addiction yeah. when done uh, properly. I, I, so I stopped drinking six years ago and I've been doing drugs ever since and I'm so much happier. What drugs do you do? 
Well, so interesting. I did Adderall, uh, which yeah. is basically meth, and yeah. it was great. Fantastic. Yeah. And then I finally had a physical side effect from it, I think, maybe. Well, did you develop a habit? Uh, maybe. But I don't know. It was easy to stop when I did. You know, sometimes I would just stop for two weeks or something, and it wasn't hard. And you never had any any discomfort the, the following day? Oh, no. No, no, no. Mm-mm. You didn't have any cravings? Oh, I mean, I would, I, I would have rather have been on Adderall, but it wasn't, <laughs> no, but it wasn't like I didn't have any withdrawal symptoms and I wasn't like white knuckling it or anything right, like right, that. Right. It was just like, eh, eh right. I'd rather be on Adderall, of course. Um, but now, yeah, for the last several weeks, I haven't done any of it, and, uh, but I've been doing cannabis and it's awesome. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm jealous of people that use Adderall because I feel, well, God damn, I would write my manuscript so much faster it's, if it's, I did, but I only tried Adderall once. I dated a woman who... Did have an Adderall habit, and I didn't know the difference, you know, because she got it as a prescription, and she s- said that it seemed to help this or that. Then we were at a party one day on somebody's patio, and everybody was talking about Adderall, and I never really did it. And somebody's like, I do this much Adderall. And I go, oh, yeah, I do it when I'm doing this. And then my girlfriend said, yeah, I, I take uh, such and such milligrams a day, and everybody on the patio went, whoa! Hmm. At the same time, everybody went, at the time I went, that's not a good sound to hear. Like, uh, Do you remember how many milligrams? I don't, <laughs> but I, she needed to take it every day, and she would f- take it to fixate like on a project. But yeah. we had not a healthy relationship. We would fight quite a bit. Yeah, She would take her Adderall, and if we had a fight, she would fixate on the fight. On the fight. 12 hours of just like fighting, zeroing in on something that That's like norm- normally people would forget about after 20 minutes. Like, okay, yeah. She would want to process the relationship. A it, lot. She, the way people focus on their exam after taking an, an yeah. Adderall, she would focus on the conflict. And so it was... Yeah, it's like me. So I, I'm not a big fan of that. <laughs> that's what I do. Adderall. For all you ladies out there, that's what you have to look forward to. So that's to. your only drug, Adderall? If you, if you get with me. Um, well, yeah, now it's just cannabis. I'm just... Can, I'm not even... I'm done. I stopped caffeine, too. I'm just, just doing cannabis. And it's, it's tough. I, I quit caffeine as well. Pretty awesome. Yeah. No, it's been kind of... Awesome. I'm really happy. <laughs> just like so, I'm rediscovering that feeling I had all those years ago, which I thought I'd lost forever. And part of it is letting go. I realized if I just told myself, okay, when you start to feel paranoid and self conscious, just let go of that. It's okay. And that worked. Yeah, I've never studied that. I don't understand. I'm sure somebody has. What is the mechanism of action? in marijuana that makes people paranoid right. or not. I have no idea what it is. I haven't studied it the way I well, have. Well, I think it's what, it's what we've been saying. It's that you see yourself from outside. And well, the... I, never, I don't put marijuana in the same category as I do psilocybin or LSD. I feel like it's a separate. Well, I, that's certainly my experience. I start to see myself, mm-hmm. right, and become aware of mm-hmm. myself much more. And it's so that's obvious, right? That's either going to be very easy if you're comfortable with yourself, or it's going to be very painful if you're not comfortable Mm. with yourself. And Mm -hmm. so I think that's part of what's happened for me as I've just become more comfortable with myself. Unfortunately, it's taken 30 years, but yeah, like in the old days, there used to be this theory, I guess it's wrong because in the old days they used to equate paranoia marijuana with the fact that it was illegal. Oh, Oh, flush, flush the stash. You know, now that it's legal, we don't have that paranoia of the cops. No, no. I was never worried about that. I mean, I was in Berkeley. I mean, I was in New York City. I was in places where no one got busted for weed, right. you know, for smoking weed. Um, no, I think it's I'm more comfortable with myself, and I was very uncomfortable with myself. But and there must be a psychological mechanism of action within the substance itself that triggers Oh, yeah, I don't know about something. Right, I don't know what that is. But it is, isn't it technically a hallucinogenic, right? It's in the sort of same class as LSD, no, as far as I'm concerned, it's not. Okay, I yeah. mean, it often is put in there. Ecstasy, as well, is sometimes lumped in as a hallucinogen. But I, to me, they're separate categories. The psychedelic category for me, and I could be wrong, is peyote, mescaline, yeah. ayahuasca, LSD, psilocybin, and then there's a couple ancillary uh, mm-hmm. type psychedelics like morning glory seeds and stuff like that. But right. I, I feel like that's the core classification of the psychedelic. And then with marijuana. Um, I think it's a, a like an herbal uh, a classification that's separate. Mm. Of course, up until very recently, they were classified by yeah. the DEA as the same thing. Schedule, Schedule, one. Schedule one. Yeah. Thank you, Obama, for extending that. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So, got to go back to the woods. So, um, there was the smelter works, two of them, and they, they were smelting zinc and... 
Cellophane? Cellophane. Do you Good. smell ze- cellophane? Good. I don't know. God, that's amazing. How horrible that was. <laughs> but they must were have the been. classic smokestack looking. <laughs> yeah. You know, like you would see in Pennsylvania. Right. Yeah. And then there was a mill, which was milling what? Paper? Pulp mills. There was many pulp mills pulp. where I grew up. And at night, uh, the, the highway that was to- closest to us, you could hear all the trucks gearing down through the night, the logging trucks. They, they smell bad? No, they smelled great. Oh, really? Because paper mills smell terrible. Oh, oh, well, these were pulp mills in the sense that, um, you know, I don't know enough about what they did. So it was a lot of burning of wood? Is well, it- one of them smelled like wood. Yeah. That was... Uh, that smells good. It smells like a Pope giant, and giant campfire. Company. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. It smelled good. Then there was a place called Kolesnikov Lumber. I don't remember them, like, having giant smokestacks, per se, that permeated the atmosphere i could be wrong so the russian pacifists pretty much all worked all the men at least worked in those places correct yeah okay here's the problem with those places and i know you know this they depend on the rape of mother earth yeah so mining feeds the smelter right which is just probably strip mining at that point wiping out whole sections of the beautiful british columbia countryside and then the Pulp mill depended on cutting down all the trees, the beautiful trees in well, British Columbia. Well, this is Columbia. what uh, so, instigated the great conflict yeah. when I was growing up between the hippie kids exactly. and the redneck kids. Yeah. And I was caught in the middle. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a protest that went on when I was a young man called uh, Clykewood Sound, which was an old, old growth forest on Vancouver Island. Nowhere near where I grew up, but it was very much in the media and the press. Hippies chaining themselves to logging equipment, spiking trees. And everybody in the province was taking a position for or against. I'm in favor of the protest. These people should be in jail, blah, blah, blah. And so where I grew up, you know, everybody's the child of a logger. They're in favor of the logging continuing and everybody's a child of a hippie and they're opposed to the logging. And so there was this sort of conflict. But by the 90s, I mean, I I can't say that my family was ever environmentalists per se. They were pacifists. They didn't believe in killing human beings. They were sometimes farmers. They would harvest things. They would build things. But ultimately, there didn't seem to be a contradiction between logging and their lifestyle. Mm-hmm. So, did, well, so did your dad work there? Where did he? Work? My dad actually was an elementary school teacher. Ah, but okay. he there's another portal. For but you. He, but he started right. as in the pulp mills first. Did he? Okay. Bef- I mean, you can work in a pulp mill without an education. So before right. he got his education, he did uh, the job that. Apparently is the toughest in a pulp mill. They call it pulling boards. You're pulling boards, which means boards are coming down a conveyor belt. You have to get them off that conveyor belt at the exact same, at the precise moment so you don't lose your hand and so that things don't back up. It's it's hard to describe because I've never done it. Yeah. But uh, he pulled boards before he went to um, university to become a school teacher. And then uh, he got set up north for his first job where he was teaching native kids in like a small trailer about 15 kids in a native community on a reservation and then came back down to where he grew up, got a job teaching at the elementary school near our house, which is a school of maybe 90 kids. So I'm imagining that's another portal for you, a portal to the world of books and words and reading. <clears throat> Not really. Nope. My, oh. <laughs> my, my dad, um, classic working class, he was a school teacher, but he didn't like reading. He liked, <laughs> drink, he liked to drink beer and watch hockey, uh-huh. which again is Good a man. Work, Canadian working class venture drinking beer and watching hockey and so that was what he lived or lived for and mm. he loved his kids but he was not i don't know that my dad ever read a book wow i don't think. what was he teach oh he's teaching elementary school. he was teaching the third grade yeah. he taught pe he taught russian and he taught the general things yeah. that you teach in the third huh. grade um, so where'd you get it from your mom my mom reads daniel Steele novels but she's not like a, a so how do you explain this well I, I think because I was de- deprived of information, when I moved to Toronto, I started getting into books because there were suddenly things I wanted to read. So why'd you go to Toronto? I moved to Toronto to do stand-up because you cannot do stand-up comedy in the woods. So you had decided at what age that you were going to be a stand-up? Um, I, I don't know when I decided. I, I, I had you know an affinity for comedy, and uh, I didn't know how you went about doing it. You'd never seen it, right? I On CBC, mm. I saw stand-up because in Montreal every year, they have the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival. And CBC used to show in the summers, as a summer replacement, the three best stand-ups of the gala at Just for Laughs 
once a week. So my first exposure to stand-up was a guy who just died named Mike McDonald, hmm. who was the biggest stand-up in Canada in an era when there were very few Canadian stand-ups and no Canadian stand-ups that stayed in Canada mm -hmm. and succeeded. There right. were people that came here, like Howie Mandel, in the early 80s who became big stars in stand-up. They right. had to move. Mike McDonald came up the Canadian stand-up circuit when there was really no circuit in the 70s, became the first Canadian stand-up star, the first Canadian with his own stand-up special. And I saw that special in his Just for Laughs gala when I was a child, when I was six or seven years old, and I loved it. Oh, God, how I loved it. I didn't know what he was doing, but I... Then it was like just for laughs. I got to get to that festival. I want to do that festival just for laughs. And then the, the movies that we rented at the gas station were all the typical Chevy Chase, Steve mm -hmm. Martin, Martin Short, John Candy, Fodder, which was also my favorite. So I moved to Toronto and I didn't think that I was good enough to be able to do stand up or comedy because I didn't know. I also didn't think I was smart enough to, to swim in Toronto because I just assume that everybody would know more about me, have more experience because it's a big city and I'm from the woods. And it was a great experiment because you learn immediately how funny you are or are not mm -hmm. in comparison to other people. And I quickly learned that nobody from Toronto was funny. <laughs> a, lot really? of them, a lot of them did stand up. Huh. They were all boring and that there were lots of funny people in Toronto and they all seemed to be from small towns. Hmm. So that was kind of an interesting learning curve. And so I, Started doing stand-up there and, and built up an act and was horrible for a long, long time and, and eventually got really good. Um, but I don't know what the, the, the spark or the reason was other than I thought maybe I could. Yeah. Were you funny at the house with your parents? My dad thought I was funny. My mom did not. Wow. And probably still. You did not stuff. have much to go on. You was well, just... school, you knew whether you were oh, funny. Oh, were you the class clown? No, because I was quiet, but I, when I spoke, the rare times that I spoke, I could get a laugh. Okay. Yeah. Huh. So I was not class clown, not class clown. And you chose not to go to college? No, well, I didn't have a high school diploma, so I don't think you... Oh, yeah, because you got kicked out. I, yeah. Right. I don't think we ever got to that story. Yeah, why did you get kicked out? I had read this book by Stan Freeberg. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Where he ran for school president, but it was just a reason to do a big joke speech maybe that's why i did stand up it may have been my first stand up performance when i ran for school president um stan freeberg campaigned on a, a platform of making uh the girls locker room see through glass walls and mm -hmm. he won <laughs> and so i thought well geez that's kind of <laughs> don't propose that these days no yeah. but i thought well that's the funny thing maybe i'll write a funny speech so in the eighth grade i wrote a speech to run for school president. And in my school, you had to be in the 11th grade in order to run, and then you would serve in the 12th grade. And so I wrote this, spe this speech in the eighth grade, and I punched it up in the ninth grade, in the 10th grade, I hid it in the mattresses of my bed. And the speech was all about how God created my school, Mount Sentinel, in seven days. On the first day, he did this. And everything I rattled off was something bad about the school that everybody knew. Uh -huh. On the first day, he said, let there be an English teacher who was assigned to this school because of a sexual harassment case at another school in Vancouver. And the student, <laughs> I was doing this speech in front of the student body of 400 <laughs> kids. Everybody went, ooh. On the second day, God said, let there be this, let there be that. And so everything was something bad about the school or some kind of secret that one of the teachers yeah. harbored. We had a, a social studies teacher who drank in class. He was oh, awesome. and these were real. You yeah. were, you oh, were yeah. letting out the dirty laundry. Yeah, exactly. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, God said, let there be a drama teacher who once did soft core pornography. Everybody went, oh, you know. So I went through this speech, and then at the end of it, I said, uh, uh, you know, actually, I forgot one detail. I, I had recorded, because I'd watched Pulp Fiction, got into black exploitation movies. I had a copy of the Shaft theme song, you know, oh, like, yeah. walk -a -chicka, walk -a and I had a kid play that music as I was introduced to do my speech. So I walked out to this, walk -a -chicka, walk -a -chicka, walk -a -chicka, did this speech. At the end of the speech, I said, if elected, I cannot give you the same promises as my opponents. I will have no power. If elected, I can do nothing for you because a student president has no power whatsoever. All I can promise is this, that if elected, I'll be the coolest I'll be the coolest fucking school president that this school has ever seen. And I said fucking. In those days, oh. it was a big deal to say the F yeah. word into the amplification system. The crowd got on their feet, cheering, roaring. And then my friend hit play and that music came on. And I walked <laughs> off. And I won. 
by a landslide. It's not that many students, but something like 400 to zero to zero was the tally. I immediately was sent to the principal's office, sat in the principal's office, and every single teacher that I had made fun of had a chance to come in one-on-one and address me. And uh, this was very uncomfortable. So I sat down. The school uh, uh, principal took off his glasses, and he was, like, massaging his face, you know, like in duress like this, and mumbling and muttering, going, never in all my years, never in all my years. The vice president or, or the vice principal came into the principal's office and starts whispering in his ear like Iago from a fellow who goes, if it was up to me, sir, he wouldn't be coming back next year. If it was up to me, sir, he wouldn't be coming back next year. The principal was going, he won't be. He won't be. He won't be. <laughs> one by one, each teacher comes in to address me. And it was sort of interesting. It was like a microcosm of each personality type. The, the drunken social studies teacher came in and he was like, I didn't fight it. I owe Jimma so that you could, you know, gave me some historical reference and chewed me out. <laughs> then the English teacher came in. He goes, you son of a bitch. And he was grinning. He goes, just tell me, did you do that to make some sort of statement or just to get votes? You know, and I, I didn't know the answer. I said, a bit of both. He goes, a bit of both. You son of a bitch. And then he walked out. <laughs> then my drama teacher walked in, the one who I said had done softcore pornography. And she had. Oh, my God. She goes, Cliff. That was an incredible performance. <laughs> so everybody's attitude was different. But I got kicked out for it and I was not well, allowed so you know, to return. As you know from writing the history of them, comedians have always found affinity with prostitutes and sex workers. So that makes perfect sense to me. That the sex worker in your school would have been the one to support oh, you. Oh, I thought, I thought you were saying I was prostituting myself. No, no, no. Somehow. She was in softcore porn, you said. Yeah, Ms. Shepard. And she, she was a great job. So, so you were a very bad kid. No. Yes. No. Yes, yes, yes. So no. when I say that, it's a great compliment. But you were. I mean, you were, you were doing exactly no. what you were not supposed to do. You sound like my mom, though, when you say it. <laughs> yeah, but see, I'm not your mom. So I think it's a good thing. I think it's a great thing. But it's also, I love that it's, it's, it all started as a rebellion against your school teachers, which is the best kind of rebellion. It kind of reminds me of a John Hughes movie a little bit. Were you inspired by them at all? No, I didn't like John Hughes movies growing up. I remember seeing Pretty in Pink. And for whatever reason, I don't know if I had ate, eaten something, but it made me physically nauseous. Huh. I remember it made me nauseous and uh, ducky and John Cryer. And then when I got older and started to date girls, I learned that they all love pretty and pink and you cannot uh, put it down. So I, was, uh, I don't usually say that out loud. But I, I never really was one who found the, the John Hughes movies didn't speak to me. I, was, I really liked stuff that didn't have any sentiment whatsoever. well the thing that i loved about them was well that i love about them now is that the villains in them are school teachers and principals yeah and that you don't see that anymore we kind of tend to lionize the teachers and principals where i'm like you know they were just disciplinarians and bosses and wardens to me yeah and probably yeah. to you too i mean that's where i that's my first rebellions were against my teachers when oh, i yeah. was in Fourth, fifth, sixth well, grade. Well, you learn about injustice yeah. when you're in elementary school and high school. Because you're trapped there. Well, and the way you can be falsely accused of something or treated, you know, punished in a way that is not rational. So, yeah, I remember in elementary school, kindergarten through the fifth grade, I never went to the principal's office for anything. I was never in trouble. The sixth grade, we had, suddenly had a new principal, and I was in the principal's office once a week and eventually once a day. And it had... Next to nothing to do with my behavior. It had to do with the power trip the guy was on. Hmm. And so that was a big lesson right away that uh, authority figures and those especially who dole out punishment, there's not necessarily any uh, justification for it and often is the opposite. I love it. Yeah, no wonder you became a comedian. So did you do stand? Did you do um, open mics at first? Is that how you started? Yeah. <clears throat> what a terrifying thing. The nerve of people who can do that. I don't even get it. How did you, when you were what, 18? When I was 18? Well, the thing about open mics is that they're generally in a place where the audience was not there for the open mic. They're there to have a hamburger or talk with their friends and or get, somebody comes or up or get and drunk, say, right? Yeah. And yeah. somebody comes up and says, we're having comedy night. And so people quickly try and pay their bills so they can leave. Mm. So a lot of the time you're performing for an audience against their will. Mm. They do not want to listen to you. <laughs> you're speaking into an amplification system, interrupting their plans and comedians are often indignant. They get mad at the audience for yeah. not paying attention or for talking when the whole purpose was these for these people was to come and talk. Right. They didn't know there was going to be a comedy show. Right. So it's always an uphill uh, a battle. But that sink or swim 
uh, aspect is what makes or breaks comedians. It's how you learn whether you're funny or not. If yeah. you can make people laugh in the worst possible circumstance, in the worst possible environment where everything's going against you, then you know you might have something. And it's, it's dangerous for any comedian to become too comfortable. You know, let's take a random example. Somebody like Bill Maher has a fan base mm. and people who go and watch Bill Maher specifically like Bill Maher. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy for him to do stand-up. But if you took Bill Maher to an open mic, if he was anonymous and said the same type of material that he did oh God. without an ingrained audience, built-in fan base, uh, or even apolitical, if he just tried to be funny at an open mic, if you would it, know if how If he funny. did his current monologues at, exactly. at an open mic, he would bomb. And if no one knew him, yeah, yeah he would bomb. Those yeah. are terrible. <laughs> so for that reason, I feel like a lot of comedians end up after success in a bit of an ivory tower. So how was your very first performance? How'd it go? My first performance was in a comedy club and I only had four jokes and only one worked. But the first joke I told got a laugh. Okay. I still remember it. And it was 1998, so it was the end of Seinfeld and um, the style of comedy was popular that Seinfeld saw. Ob observational. I, yeah, so my, my opening joke was, uh, don't you guys just hate it when you're listening to Mariah Carey <laughs> so that was the joke and then it got a laugh yeah. and then the last three bombed the last three i don't remember and they did not get a laugh yeah. and when you only have four jokes that's not a lot of material to begin with i was also i think more uh writerly already because i thought mm. oh you write jokes and then you tell them and then you get off yeah very mechanical yeah right? whereas most comedians they go up on stage and they talk right and if they're new especially they don't stop talking they're on stage way too long they don't realize that they're bombing i was hyper aware of where my laughs should be because i wrote these jokes mm. so if i wasn't getting laughs you know i got the fuck out of there and i did so my first gig was at a comedy club in ajax ontario which was a factory town about an hour north of toronto um, where they had a nuclear power plant. It was in a strip mall. Uh, between the Yuck Yucks Comedy Club was a porn store and an uh, office for an MLA, a member of uh, the legislation, uh, a member of parliament in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And I went up on stage and I got that first laugh and it was great. And then the silence after wasn't. But I was done after a minute. I said, good night. I got off stage and cardinal sin and stand-up i left the stage empty because the mc had left you know you like this kid's going to be on stage for 10 minutes thinking you know so he came running out of the bathroom zipping up his fly to this empty stage you know um but i remember the show fairly well the comedians that were on it i admired so much because they were so uh experienced and they could hold a room for 45 minutes a guy named mike wilmot who uh went to england and worked with ed uh hall a lot not ed hall um, rich hall they became a bit of a team in England, and then later he became Lewis Black's opening act here mm. in the States. Mike Wilmot was on this show. A um, guy named Jason Rouse, who was the one who really encouraged me to do stand-up and try comedy clubs. And he said, if you ever want to get up at a Yuck Yucks, I can get you spots. And he was really hot at the time. And uh, he lives here now and isn't hot anymore. But hmm. so, but there was talent around you. You could see them. You could you had, you had models. Well, my uh, um, definition of or perspective of what talent was was different then as it is to now. Because at the time, I did not understand how anybody could control a room right. for 45 minutes and make people laugh. To me, it was like a superhuman yeah. magic trick. Yeah. So anybody could do that uh, mm -hmm. was a hero to me. Even if they, in retrospect, were a horrible comedian. Because there's guys who I thought were just brilliant who now, in retrospect, I go, oh, they were just doing all those tricks mm -hmm. that once you start doing stand-up, you figure out yeah. all crutches, things that will get a laugh, you right. know, hack jokes and, and references and, and, and whatever. You know, there's a magic trick in stand-up that if you talk really fast without stopping for a minute, you'll get a huge applause at the end of it. Really? Yeah. If, if you're trying to describe something in stand-up, you go, so I did this and I went to that, and the guy said this and I said that, and I said this and that, and I said that, and I said, if you don't do that, then I will die. And then everybody explodes I've in the seen, audience. Yeah, I've seen that many times. We okay. do it all the time. So that kind of magic huh. trick I didn't see through at the time. So I just admired everybody yeah. who could do it. Right. And then once I got good at it, I became such a snob. I had less respect for a lot of those people. I, I still 
respect the guys that I started with and who pushed me when I started out because that's like okay. your nostalgia, your sentiment. So, so you said you got good. How did you, and if, I love how you first thought it was just about the writing. And if you write the joke correctly, it will get laughs. And it turned out it didn't. And so what did you do to get good? You have to get comfortable on stage. And you can only do that by going up on stage all the time, as often as possible, for as long as possible. Okay. Every comedian, if you look at you know, Conan O'Brien's first year as a talk show host, he's so uncomfortable and awkward, mm. and now he's full of confidence. It's the same in stand-up. You watch the first year of any stand-up, no matter how great they became, they seem stodgy, awkward, stilted. They're uncomfortable because it's an unnatural thing to go on stage mm-hmm. and address people in this manner. Hold you know? the mic. I mean, the whole thing. The whole thing is... Looking, un- into, looking into the lights. The, th- yeah. the whole thing's unnatural. So yeah. you have to do it often enough so that it becomes natural. Yeah. So that's what happened with me. Eventually, I became comfortable. This was by accident. I started doing a character on stage. And in character, because it wasn't me... I could say anything, do anything, get away with anything, and I was extremely comfortable in character. At the same time, I was doing my other act as myself, still doing that very writerly format, and I was so awkward and uncomfortable. And so oddly enough, at the same time, around 2002, 2003, 2004, this character that I sometimes did in stand-up became extremely popular. And myself in stand-up, remained unpopular mm-hmm. and the character act took off but it was because i was really comfortable on stage could yeah. improvise could address any situation at any moment in the room in character but not as myself who was the character i did an old-timey comedian named shecky gray oh here you go here's the roots of your later career in I guess. a way yeah okay. and the reason i did it shecky gray instead of shecky green yeah and okay. i didn't even know who shecky green was right. at the time oddly enough um, hmm. And usually characters are frowned upon in stand-up as well as being sort of like a... Wait, wait, wait. You made up the name Shecky without knowing... About- I knew the word, I knew the name Shecky referred to old okay. comedy. Okay. And I think most people do. Yeah. But m- most people don't realize it refers to a specific person and yeah. there was only one comedian named Shecky. Right. <laughs> and he's still alive. And you didn't even know that at the time. No, That's at the funny. time I didn't know. <clears throat> but anyways, I was doing an open mic at, at a dive bar in Toronto in the worst part of town. That was not a comedy open mic. It was like for guitars, you know, music open mic. And I needed stage time. So I would sign up on Tuesdays and I would be the only comedian. And it was a tough bar. Nobody paid attention. Everybody talked. Everybody in the audience was drunk and fighting. It was mostly elderly (laughs) men. Oh, my God. Pensioners. You could buy a sleeve of beer for 90 cents and drink it. And criminals would come in off the street and sell cartons of cigarettes and blocks of cheese to old men for five bucks while you're on stage. So I go up and do my regular act and... Never worked because nobody was paying attention. Nobody was listening. Most people's backs were to the stage while I was on stage. And this one day, because it was a music open mic, there was a drum kit behind me and I picked up a drumstick that was on the ground and I hit the cymbal and it made this tremendous crash, just this huge sound. Everybody in the room went silent and looked at the stage and I told my next joke and everybody laughed Hmm. because they were paying attention. So I hit the symbol again, like a rim shot. And I told another joke and I got a laugh. And another joke, I got a laugh and I left the stage. And it was the first time that I or probably anybody got laughs at this open mic. So the next week I came back like I normally would, but I came up with a reason to hit that symbol. And I decided I would do an old timey comic who does like a rim shot. So I put mm. on like a necktie. I did this character, Shecky, <clears throat> Shecky Gray. And eventually the character evolved into a real living character and i would go up on stage and say good evening ladies and gentlemen my name is shecky gray i am an internationally renowned and professional professional comedian i recently threw a party for all my impotent friends but nobody came (laughs) oh and then i would hit the symbol now we're cooking with gasoline i was walking down the street the other day saw a lady Said, hey, miss, your pants are coming down. She looked, said, no, they're not. I said, sorry, I've made up my mind. Smash. Oh, now we're working. So I do these corny jokes and hit the symbol. And after every time I hit the symbol, I would do a line. Now we're working. Now we're cooking with gasoline. And each one would become increasingly more absurd. Now we're poking holes in the Pope's condoms. And I had about 100 of those. And the only line that I really remember now was late 90s, early 2000s. Christopher Reeve was still alive. And I had this line. Now we're wishing that Keanu was the Reeves in a wheelchair. You know, (laughs) 
<laughs> and so that became the act, hitting the symbol and just doing those. Now we're doing this. Now we're doing that. Now we're doing that. I would do that for about three minutes, this obnoxious thing. And the crowd loved it. But the other thing I learned in doing an obnoxious character, and I think Steve Martin learned this in the 70s, Sam Kinison learned this in the 80s, and anybody who's obnoxious on stage learns this. When you're obnoxious on stage, you invite an obnoxious audience. Uh So I would do these shows and my audience would start yelling at me. Uh And part of my act became me and the audience yelling at each other. And I became an insult comic eventually (laughs) where I was just improvising insults. And I used to do a gig at a punk bar in Vancouver, 2004 or five. um, And people would line up when they knew that it was about time where I was going to come on stage. There'd be a single file at the foot of the stage. This was never coordinated or planned. And each person would take a turn heckling me and then I would insult them. And then the next person would come up and that became my act there in that specific room. Wow. So through that character, I became extremely obnoxious and extremely comfortable on stage. And that's where I found my greatest stand-up success And then I was able to transfer that comfortability that I found on stage to my normal act and became a much better comic, not much more successful, but a much more uh, confident comic on stage in my own voice. Who were you channeling? Nobody. I just was doing that How did you get that? How did you know that they sounded that way? Because that that sounds like Like an an amalgam of all the Catskills, all the vaudeville comedians, right? Yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. How did it get get into you? But now when I tell stories about old men that I've interviewed for my book and who got mad at me, guys like Jack Carter. They all sound like that. They all sound like that um, because I make them sound like that. I think when I relay the story of Jack Carter, I said to Jack Carter, hey, I found a photo of you in an old newspaper with Sophia Loren. Sophia Loren was a Spanish whore. (laughs) Like what, Jack? First of all, she's Italian. But, uh, it, you know, his voice sort of did channel that sort of rage. I don't know where that, uh, where that came from. It was just a thing. Well, it's also the accent is, you know, it's New York Jew also. It's a New York Jewish accent. Well, I was very anti-Semitic in those days. I was going to say. That's where it came from. I mean, you know, you could be accused of doing, <clears throat> what would it be called? Jew face? No, I don't think so. I, I don't think anybody would. I wouldn't. I'm just saying you could be, right? <laughs> I mean, right? You're kind of- I have natural resting Jew face. Yeah. <laughs> so that's an interesting thing about your book, which is that the first half to two thirds, I guess, is about those generations from the early 20th century until about the 50s, early 60s. Not entirely, but would you say overwhelmingly or overwhelmingly Jewish? I just think it's fascinating that you were channeling essentially an old Jewish Catskills comedian when you were like, how old were you? And you didn't know anything about it at the time. I started stand up when I was 18 and I developed that character when I was 21. It's eerie, isn't it? You didn't know anything about that world. Well, I was collecting records at thrift stores. So I had come across a few old comedy records. They didn't sound like that on the record, but there was enough old show busy element to it where I got a feel for something. There was a guy named Alan Gale, G-A-L-E, completely obscure. Even in his day, he was obscure. He was a Florida comedian who sometimes did New York. And his comedy record um, had this incredible introduction, this fanfare, like a drum roll and a guy going, ladies and gentlemen, Jack Silverman's International is proud to present your entertainer. Alan Gale! And then this music. And this guy comes out. He's a comedian. Doesn't sound like a comedian. A uh, bottle of champagne for this table right here. Can we get a bottle of champagne? Like he's not even telling jokes. He's working the room. Who's got a wedding here tonight? You know? And it was from the 50s. And so, in a loose way, my character was sort of based on that. Not based on him, but maybe. Like, I placed the character in that universe. Yeah. Like, he'd come out of that universe and ended up in a punk rock bar or a dive bar. Yeah. And he's indignant at the fact that these people aren't laughing at his stuff. Don't you know who I am? I, yeah, I just love it because you, you had nothing to do with that world. You no. Were, you had nothing to do with that world. No. Yeah. It's amazing, right? People do it all the time. I mean, people, it's called cultural appropriation now. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on now. Hold on. Well, no, I'm against saying that, but that's what it's called. I think it's great. I think I don't it's, think, I think anybody would have uh, uh, deduced well, Shecky Gray as technically, Jewish cultural. Oh, but technically it is, right? It, I don't think so. No. 
Look, you, you understand, right? I think it's a great thing. I'm, See, I, I, I'm the opposite. I do believe in cultural appropriation oh, yeah? as a thing, as okay. a thing that exists. Well, so why is that not cultural appropriation? You're using the voice, the style, the tone. You're mocking. You're actually making fun of, to some extent, those old Jewish performers. Well, how do you know he's Jewish to begin with? Okay, fair enough. But I think anybody who knew anything about that history would immediately identify that person as a Jewish man. No? Maybe. There were no... Shecky. Shecky is a Jewish nickname. Shecky Green is Jewish. That's yeah. true. Yeah. So I'll give you that. But I think that's where it would start and where it would end. Hmm. I can't think of any other example within Again, the act that would be considered no, Let me reiterate. I think it was a great thing, so I'm not criticizing. Well, I'm not disagreeing with you. But I'm thinking okay. if I was in the audience as somebody who was a subscriber to the theory of cultural appropriation, yeah. which I am when it comes to native culture, uh-huh. um, would I see it through that lens as a Jewish parody yeah. or a Jewish, Jewish appropriation? Mm-hmm. I can't put myself in those shoes. Maybe I would, I wouldn't, but my instinct is to say no. But, but then again, maybe my instinct is out of a defense. Who knows? But I don't feel like there were any elements where I, you know, I wasn't dressed up in a certain way. I was wearing a necktie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you probably didn't get in trouble because A, it was in the 1990s and B, no one in Vancouver in the 1990s. Not, there wasn't much of a Jewish population in Vancouver then. Still isn't. But and and very little of a what I would say a woke Jewish population in Vancouver too. So it just wasn't a thing. It didn't. It, it wouldn't register for them. I don't know. You know, if I was appropriating anything, it would have been Tony Clifton. You know what I mean? It was more a uh, uh, a takeoff on the Bill Murray lounge singer. You know, the bad performer with the ego who's indignant about the way the I- audience reacts. Other than the name Shecky, I don't know. I think if you did that act in Brooklyn now, eventually some writer for Tablet Magazine would write something about you being a cultural appropriator. Well, if I was still doing stand-up, which I'm not, I would, I would put it to the test and see if that was true and, or not. And I would write something telling them to go fuck themselves. Yeah. But you would be. I think they'd be technically correct. But to me, that's just an argument that I cultural mean, appropriation is a good thing, actually. I mean, you may, you, but, may, you may be right. You may be right. I don't think it's a good thing necessarily because everything is circumstantial. Every example is circumstantial, including this one. Yeah. So you may be right. Sure. I appreciate the fact that you're defending me, and I appreciate the fact that I'm attacking. Not defending. defending me. I'm celebrating, actually. I'm going further than defending. <laughs> but I wonder if somebody like me were in the audience, if I would, which position I would take watching my own act. Yeah. That's what I'm asking, and I don't know the answer to that. But I think I would probably think it wasn't cultural appropriation as somebody who does believe in You need to spend more time on college campuses. Then you'll know. I've never... I've that never... What you did was very, very bad. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, there is, it is interesting to think like how I would have fared as a stand-up now. Uh, if I had kept doing stand-up all these years, I quit in 2006. So I would have been doing it for 19 years this year if I hadn't quit. But I only did it for eight years. Um, if my jokes would still work. Because one of my opening jokes that I did always got a huge laugh and it always got the right laugh. I didn't think people were laughing at it for the wrong reasons. But I wonder if I did it today, if people would misunderstand it immediately in a knee-jerk way. I used to open my act with this joke. Boy, it's great to be here. You know, this is a great venue. You guys are a great crowd. And, you know, a lot of times when I do stand-up, I get booked at really inappropriate venues. Um, You know, for instance, I did a show the other night at a sports bar and they just hated me. But this is the thing about stand-up comedy. You got your good shows, you got your bad shows. No matter what, you always walk away having learned something new. For instance, last night at this sports bar, I learned that I'm a fucking fag. (laughs) And I wonder if I did that joke today, if it would have a different reaction. Oh, they would like that now. They yeah. would like it. Yeah, because you're making fun of meatheads of, you know. Yeah, exactly. Of yeah. course I am. Republican but meatheads. Yes, yeah, of sure. course. They would love that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I was going to say that you're, one of the things I noticed about your book is that the first half to two-thirds of it is about those generations of comedians who you were channeling, basically. The vaudeville era, the Catskills, the Borscht Belt, New York City, mostly, not entirely, but I would think it's safe to say mostly Jewish comedians, right? Jewish and black. Well, it's a little later, right? The black comedians come a little later? <clears throat> no, it's the same time, but it was separate. 
uh, okay. Well, I mean, the, to- the Toba circuit and the vaudeville circuit happen concurrently. Yeah, oh, that's true. Toba circuit. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess. Well, your your book doesn't deal with the blacks until a little bit later. I guess. But... Yeah, maybe in my book there's more emphasis on vaudeville. Yeah. There isn't any emphasis on the Toba circuit per se. I was going to say that was my other thing I noticed. Um, yeah, that the black comedians didn't arrive until late in the book, but I don't think that's necessarily wrong. I mean, because I don't know. Um, anyway, the, the thing I was going to say is that you don't really even mention that they're Jewish for much of it. That's mm-hmm. just you'll sort of name lots of them who mm-hmm. are all Jewish and identified as Jewish, and mm-hmm. it was part of their act, you know, of being Jewish. Mm-hmm. And, it's very much a Jewish humor, right, that they were performing. Um, but you don't make anything or very little of it. You do talk about how they face discrimination, mm-hmm. um, some of them. But you don't make anything. And I don't know. I'm just thinking about this. Mm-hmm. Like, I, you don't make anything of it, right? Some people have said, oh, well, it's the reason so many Jews are comedians and have been comedians is because of the Jewish culture of intellectualism and bookishness and being outsiders perpetually, mm-hmm. right? A stateless people and outsider people always. And yeah. that gave rise to this Jewish affinity for comedy. Nope. You don't buy well, I think it. It's or... all, well, yeah, it's all nonsense, but oh. I think that, <laughs> I mean, the reason Do you, really, you think it's all nonsense. Well, in terms, there's no equation of, um, uh, sense of humor and, uh, uh, race, you know, I think that, well, there's culture, culture, there's culture, but I think that Jewish it's, culture, it, not, I don't think it, that not, it, not their blood, their yes, culture, Jewish, yeah. cu- sorry, not race yeah. culture. Yeah. Um, I, I just don't buy it, you know, because okay. a lot of the times when you hear that it's spoken, so that was deliberate. That wasn't just an accident. No, it was a matter of focus. What do you want to focus on? And yeah. this is why I wrote my book. Cool is out of frustration of reading other comedy books or cool. books about comedy where I just don't feel like it, I agree with it. I feel like most um, of the Jewish comedians of the early 20th century were in comedy not because of an inherent ability or affinity for comedy, but because of uh, other job options being closed. And so minorities could always be mm. show people. Same with mm-hmm. black culture. Mm-hmm. So the black culture and Jewish culture involved in comedy right at the early um yeah. stage for the same reason because sure. they're yeah. restricted from other areas mm-hmm. not because they were funnier than other cultures necessarily so there's a lot of jewish comedians throughout history who weren't funny yes. a lot of famous ones because they hired people that were funny to write for them that's true and in those days that's how you worked as a comedian you did not have to be funny to right. be a professional comedian you needed to be bold enough to go up on stage and be able to remember what you memorized, but you didn't have to be funny. You hired writers or you got a joke book and you memorized stock jokes and you could tour for an entire career with the same 20, 30 minutes of material and never change it before television. Millions of people weren't going to see your act simultaneously. Mm -hmm. They'd see it in this town and then this town and then down here a year later. And so you could do the same act that wasn't um, anything uh, inspired by yourself or your own culture. So I disagree that there's a specific trait hmm. that would uh, equate uh, black people or Jewish people as being funnier, or have a more inherent ability for comedy. I don't subscribe to any hmm. of that. I can't deny that the history of comedy is dominated by black performers and Jewish performers. It mm-hmm. is. But I think that's because they were shut out of other mm-hmm. areas. Mm hmm. Then why aren't there? Why were there so few female comics? <clears throat> That's a good question too. But there were a lot of female comic performers. They may not have uh, uh, been what we define as a stand-up, but mm-hmm. there were tons of women in comedy teams. Mm. There were tons of women performing in comedy sketches. There were t- tons of women that were comic actors. Uh, on Broadway, mm-hmm. in sketch reviews, yep. in radio, okay. Fanny Bryce, Burns and Allen, a lot. But when it comes to stand-up, stand-up was kind of a new conceit, as we think of it in modern times, starting around the 1920s. Mm-hmm. There were people that had done it before, like Mark Twain, but it was never defined as stand-up mm-hmm. comedy or even defined as comedy. It was defined right. as a lecture from a humorist. You know? Right. So, hmm. you know, we could deduce different reasons why but i don't believe that there was an inherent comedy gene for comic trait which a lot of people like to subscribe to in the sense that like there's documentaries about the jewish sense of humor and often the cliche is it comes from suffering it comes from suffering and then my question is sort of like the question you just posed me why aren't there more women i say well then why aren't 
why isn't comedy dominated by Native Americans if yeah, comedy right. comes from suffering? Yeah, you know? exactly. So I don't subscribe to a lot of those cliches. I don't pretend to have the answers either. Okay. But I definitely reject a lot of the uh, mm-hmm. more commonly accepted um, theories. That get thrown That's good. About. Yeah, you certainly don't attempt to fit them into any grand theory. That's for sure. You don't squeeze anybody into some theory, some grand narrative about this, some causal explanation. Um, you just tell their stories. Yeah. And I take it that was your purpose, right? Well, you know, a lot of books about comedy try and, like, analyze it. Yeah. <laughs> or they give you examples of the person's material and, and show it to you and say, see, it's funny. But it might not be funny to you. So mm-hmm. then the author's credibility goes out of the window as soon as they say this is funny or they give you an example of something that's quote-unquote funny. If you don't find it funny you're not going to have any faith in that author anymore. So I don't give examples of people's material. I don't describe them as funny. I don't describe them as unfunny. I simply uh, tell the story of what happened to them in their life. Yeah. What's that great line? You use it as an epigraph in one of your chapters uh, by Jonathan Winters. Um, Just tell the truth. It'll get a laugh. (laughs) Tell the truth and people will laugh. Tell the truth and people will laugh. Now, there's a deeper philosophical question, which we will totally not discuss as to whether there is such a thing as truth. But we will discuss what we think he meant by that. What do you think he meant by that? People laugh when they recognize something they're familiar with. That's why references in comedy get big laughs, even if there's no joke. Mm -hmm. So Dennis Miller often made obscure references in his act. And they got big laughs from people in the audience who got the reference and got no laughs from people who didn't. Um, so that's sort of, I don't know if that analogy. Well, I was going to say, it's not just that it's, it's not that they're speaking about things that people know about because you don't walk up on stage and say, look, I'm on a stage. Yeah. But you're, if you, if you speak, it's, yeah, but if you say something that is on everybody's mind, that's true, it's going to get a reaction. It's on their minds, but they're not allowed to say it. Isn't that what it is? Isn't that what winners was talking about? You say, you say things that, well, I I would say it's heavy handed to say not allowed. Maybe don't normally say would be better. Okay. Could be allowed to say something. Yeah. Unspoken, large, you know, largely known, but largely unspoken. Is yeah, to a, to a degree. It's like when you go to a comedy club and there's people in the audience, like a wife and a husband or a girlfriend and a husband. The comedian says something on stage about men and women and then the the date is elbowing her yeah. husband. That's just like us. And they're laughing. There's yeah. a recognition process right. that is somehow equated with laughter. But I don't really get into the... But it's made public rather than staying private within yeah. the relationship. And that's yeah. what makes it funny. You know, I don't know. What, you don't do this. I don't know what makes it funny, and I don't care what makes it funny. No, I really don't. Like yeah. it doesn't. To me, it's a, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mm. matter. It's like, why can't you tickle yourself if you, even if you're super ticklish? Why does it not work? Mm. Who, who knows? Who cares? It really doesn't matter. So I don't really. If you read my book, I really don't get into any of those yeah. debates about why something's funny or something. I get emails all the time from weird people. I don't know who they are. I am a senior fellow at the Institute of Laughter, and we're doing a study. (laughs) As you may know, we've submitted over 500 papers, and our meeting last year brought together 2,000 people from around the world, laughter experts. I'm like, who the fuck are you? Get away from me. Hmm. This is the opposite of my interest in comedy, and this is also what destroys it for people like myself who want to write about comedy in an entertaining way so many people write about comedy and make it so fucking boring mm. and uninteresting and and split hairs on these semantic debates that are usually held between people that aren't funny and aren't involved in comedy. <laughs> you hang around comedians, they no, do not no, have no, these people debates. known as professors, you mean. Yes. I guess, I don't know. I, yeah. I've never yeah. had Academics. one. Academics. I never had one. I don't you're know. speaking of my people. <clears throat> yeah. When my book came out, it was funny because I got to lecture at some places that were uh college educated or university sponsored or whatever and it was funny because i was treated really well and people were really interested in what i said and i realized i would never be able to get into this school because i don't have a high school diploma and and because of your history with jew face <laughs> so i really it, 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 it tracks you forever you'll never lose that yeah. you'll always be known as the guy who did the jew face no this, this is the first i've heard of it it's on this show <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. So I, I'm a hyper analytical kind of guy. And so I will admit that I was perplexed, bemused by it, by your book in that way. I I was expecting some kind of analysis, but I might be wrong. I don't know. Well, what would the purpose of analysis, I mean, you can, 
yeah. analyze something. When you write history, you've written history books. Yeah. Do you analyze? So or, have you. That's what that book is. It's yeah, a history book. Yeah, but I tell the story mm -hmm. that I choose, yeah. by the way, as we both do. We choose which stories to tell and which ones totally. to tell. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that my book is, you know, I could write a whole separate version of my book, completely totally. different characters, completely different totally. stories. Totally. You know? Same here. Yep. Um, but it's never the purpose, or I feel it shouldn't be the purpose of the historian to, to analyze in an editorial fashion. Mm -hmm. You analyze in the sense of what you decide what to include and what not to include, but you don't need to provide analysis of the why. You can provide analysis or exemplify what occurred, and people can conclude whether it's the cause and effect that made it happen. So I can say what happened in the 20s, and you can read what happened in the 50s, and maybe you as a reader will say, geez, what happened in the 50s seems to be because of what happened in the 20s. Without me writing or deciding mm -hmm. this happened because of this. So that's what I don't do. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just a one way of doing history. Mm -hmm. One might say, and you sort of just did say it, that the analysis is embedded in or implied by your selection of stories, right? Reading somebody else's analysis is usually boring. Boring, yeah. And that to me is the cardinal sin of any author, yeah. any artist, any historian is mm -hmm. being boring. Why would you do something that would possibly alienate your audience by being dull, you know? So there's stories in my book that objectively, by most standards, are maybe not as historically important as other stories that I maybe didn't include, but the other stories were maybe less interesting. So a good example, Albert Brooks's father, Bob Einstein's father, their dad was a comedian named Harry yeah, Einstein. Right. Parky Carcass did a character in radio in the 30s on Eddie Cantor's program, very popular. Not really a historical figure in, in the history of comedy in terms of influence, with the exception of the fact well, he gave his, birth his progeny, yeah. to Albert Brooks and Bob Einstein. Right. But in 1958, he was booked on a Friars Club roast of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. Uh, he had crippling back pain for the previous eight years, which kept him from performing. But he still performed at Friars Roasts because he could lean on the podium and then sit down at the dais. He didn't have to do much exertion. He could tell his jokes that way. He performed at this Friars Club roast of Lucy and Desi, went up on stage, fifth, I think, on the lineup, destroyed, brought down the house in front of a thousand people, had the set of his life, sat down next to Milton Berle, back at his seat in the, on the dais, and dropped dead in front of a thousand people. And so I tell that story in my book because I think it's a great story. And there's a lot more that happened in that circumstance that I try and frame. But... Because of him, maybe somebody else got pushed out of my book, like Red Skelton or Bob and Ray, who had much more influence and probably are much more historically notable in that decade than Harry Einstein. But I made an editorial decision that, mm -hmm. you know, when I was told I have to cut out this amount of words, you know, for the final manuscript, I'm going to keep in the stories that are more interesting than mm -hmm. not. It's interesting when you say that analysis can't be entertaining because what I think about comedians is that that's what they're doing. They're doing analysis. Well, I was thinking specifically analyzing comedy yep. is going to. Well, I know. I'm just saying that people. I think that they prove that analysis can be highly entertaining because that isn't. Don't you think of well, I mean, stand-up comedy yeah, I guess it as analysis? On your de yeah, I guess it depends on your definition. But in the terms of the that we were thinking of analysis, I'm thinking of a scholarly dissertation as oh. opposed to a, a nightclub comedy. Well, sure, yeah, but yeah. Which is what a lot of these people oh, who analyze comedy do. Believe me, I know all about it, having come from that world, that most of what I've read as a PhD is boring. Sure. Yeah. I just think that you can do analysis and be highly entertaining. But does that, does that sit? So, seldom happens. Does it, yeah. Does that sit right with you, though, that comics are analysts, social analysts? Does that sound right? They're doing analysis in their acts? Sure. I mean, um, like, again, it's like a question that is meaningless to me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because the importance of a comedian is to make people laugh mm -hmm. first, fo first, foremost, and last. Mm -hmm. You know, anything else that you want to throw in there is fine. But if somebody is not like a cultural critic or a, if somebody's just doing Im impressions, you know, that's good too. It, it, all that matters is what you're curious about, like what your questions are, right? And so if your questions are, why are there so many damn Jews in the you know early comedy, then the book has to be different. But if your question is, what were their lives like? Right. What was the what was the work like? What was being a comedian like? Guess, That's the book that you wrote. I guess. Isn't you know, it? It's not something I ever think 
So maybe. Because you that's your book. I mean, because you guess, get a real good sense of guess, what it was like to do that. I see. I don't think in those terms. I guess you're right. But, you know, what I think of is uh, what's interesting and what's boring mm-hmm. and how do I avoid the boring and include the interesting. So actually, when I got my book deal, it was only supposed to be about comedians and the mafia. That was the original mm-hmm. premise. Mm-hmm. Because in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, nine times out of ten, if you did stand up, you were working for the mob because yeah. they ran all the clubs. That's right. And so that's my premise for the book. That's what I pitched. And they said, we'd like that, but go back further to vaudeville days, come up more current to uh, podcasts. And I was like, ah, fuck, I don't really want to write about podcasts. And I don't know. Grove Press. They did the same thing to me. They they made my book 10 times bigger. I don't really want to write about vaudeville. At the time, I thought I couldn't make it interesting because I didn't know enough about it, I guess. I found a way to make vaudeville very interesting, I think, and I hope. And it's a the opening chapter and it grabs a lot of people Mm -hmm. but if it was boring i couldn't use it as the opening chapter so all i think about is grabbing attention in terms of what i write and what will keep people interested Mm -hmm. so i focus very hard you know there's the old journalism cliche about the opening line and i have a different application i think it's because i never went to school so i didn't learn anything so i just taught myself and subscribed to my own rules which is to make the last sentence of every paragraph, the most interesting and the most profound because it'll continue people to read. So I don't think that that's the purpose of my book. What you're saying for me, when I was writing it, the only purpose is to tell a story that's not boring. That was the only intention. So anything else that it achieves is well, it's fine. Didn't you also want to elevate comedians in the minds of, I mean, you didn't care about the subject? Well, I care about comedians. I don't want to elevate them. Oh, they don't need me to elevate. Well, you want, okay. Comedians, a comedian. If they make you laugh, you what, like them. But, if they don't make you laugh, you don't. But why That's, did you write a book about comedians? I was I got an offer. <laughs> I got a great offer to write a book about comedians. I okay. never intended to write a book. I okay. was doing it as a Why hobby. did they offer it to you? What were you doing? <clears throat> I was interviewing elderly comedians, uh-huh. getting their stories. I found them interesting. The real Sheckies. The real Sheckies of the world. Yeah. Jack Carter, Will Jordan, all guys that whose names have sort of been lost to history, who did a ton of Ed Sullivan shows in the 50s. Here's why I focused on those guys. History, unfortunately, as you know, sloppy history is annoying. People often uh, jump time periods and still try and connect a dot or draw a through line. But I feel like you cannot write about the 1910s and then the 1950s without writing about what happens in between, or at least talking about it. Indeed. So in the history of comedy, people talk about the Catskills. I went and saw a horrible Catskills Yeah, you really downplay the Catskills in the book, too. Uh, well, no, I got, in my defense, I had to cut out 125,000 words. You might be right. You said, I, I, you actually persuaded me. You said and it was more important what was going on in New York City, which makes all the sense in the world to me. Well, that is true. Yeah, sure. But I'm not saying the Catskills themselves weren't important. They, they produced a lot of people, but the real deals that were made were made in New York City. The thing City. is that it's people who played the Catskills also performed in Los Angeles. Right. They also performed in New York City. Sure. The guys who only played the Catskills... You don't even know their names. They never became famous. Right. So the Catskills wasn't important in that regard. Right. It was important because it was a good paying gig. Yeah. And that's what a comedian cares about is, yeah, I'll do any shitty gig, good gig you ask me to. If you're going to pay me enough, mm-hmm. I'll do it. Outdoors, 2 p.m. Right. If you're paying me $10,000, I'll do it. So the Catskills were that. But those comedians from the Catskills who became famous became famous because they were in Manhattan where radio was, where television was. But anyways... I was going to say that I went and saw a terrible Catskills documentary that Mm. showed black and white footage of people dancing and swimming in the Catskills. And then it jump cut to a clip of Kramer coming through the door on Seinfeld. And it said, if not for the Catskills, there would be no Seinfeld. And that annoyed me so much where I was like, (laughs) your theory possibly could make sense, but only if you explain and connect all the dots that happened in between. Because otherwise you're alienating the viewer who goes, what? What? The it, fuck are you talking about? Black and white footage of somebody on a diving board? It means Seinfeld? It's reductionist and deterministic, <laughs> we would say. Yeah, it's right. It reduces the whole thing to just this, this one moment. You have, moment to, t- in you have to talk right? about the evolution. So One cause. Monocosm, guys like yeah. Jack Carter, Myron Cohen, Alan King, Will Jordan, Martin Lewis, a woman named uh, Jean Carroll, a female comedy team named Betty and Jane Keene. All of these were the comedians in the late 40s. Post vaudeville pre-television, not necessarily Catskill comedians, didn't have their own big radio shows. They were what I call schleppers. They were working 
this arduous grind, getting good at their craft. And they all came out of World War II mostly. Mm -hmm. 1946, 47, 48, 49, 50, Manhattan had a series of presentation houses. Most of them used to be vaudeville houses that were turned into movie houses. Comedians, a singer, a dance team, and an orchestra would perform for 45 minutes before the screening of the movie. And then after the movie, they would get rid of the audience, they'd bring in a new audience, they'd do it all over again. And comedians of that generation, the comedians who then became the stars of TV, like Milton Berle, Phil Silvers, Jerry Lester, who did the first late night show, and all the comics you saw in Ed Sullivan in the 50s, came out of that universe, came out of that world, toured that grind. And nobody had ever really written about that before. And I felt like that was an important lost cog that predates uh, Jonathan Winters and Mort Saul and Lenny Bruce, but comes after all these vaudevillians and the 30s era. So for me, it wasn't that I was elevating comedians or comedy, but I wanted to get the story straight, get the facts straight. Because even a lot of comedians themselves don't know the history mm -hmm. of stand-up. Right. And so I got to befriend and speak with a lot of guys in their 90s, and even a woman named Connie Sawyer, who just died at the age of 105, wow. who started doing stand-up in San Francisco in 1938. And I got all their stories down and would transcribe them and put them online, eventually fed them into a series of articles for WFMU, who had an online magazine at the time I was mm. writing for. And the response to these articles and interviews was so tremendous. I was living in Vancouver at the time. People from New York were contacting me in Los Angeles. People like George Schlatter, who created Laugh-In, goes, Hey, I read that article about Moms Mabley. We got to get you down here. Are you in uh, New York or are you in Los Angeles? I go, I'm in, I'm in Canada. goes, Canada? What the fuck are you doing in Canada? Jesus Christ. We brought Lauren Michaels down here in 1968. That cock-sucking Mountie never thanked me. You know. <laughs> Sucking Mountie. So that that kind of thing, <laughs> otherwise known as Lauren Michaels, yeah, that kind of stuff um, <laughs> taught me that maybe there's an audience for this kind of thing. And then Mark Marin, one of the many comedians yeah. who was reading my stuff, contacted me and invited me to do his show because yeah. <clears throat> he's very interested in the history of comedy. He's interested in the history of comedy, yeah. and most comedians are. Mm -hmm. And so that's been my big career boost has been comedians like. Anthony Jeselnik or mm -hmm. Norm MacDonald or Bill Burr gave me a nice sh shout out on his podcast. I don't know him, but he read the book. And, wow. um, uh, you know, Steve Martin, who has been so nice to me um, mm. and said such nice things about the book, Albert Brooks, Mel Brooks, all these giants, yeah. heroes of mine huh. who have really gotten behind me, my work, my book and those interviews. And that to me is all that matters. I don't care if a person who isn't, a comedian doesn't think I'm funny or doesn't think my work is good. It doesn't really matter because the people who do it, who we admire, who we consider artists in their field or the best in their field, appreciate it. They like it. They think it's good. And to me, that's good enough. And that's all that matters. And it means that what I did was, in my mind, correct. It did supersede all these other books people wrote about comedy. And I know it sounds like egomania, but really reading other books about comedy drove me crazy because I felt like people were missing the mark. Mm -hmm. So I think I hit the mark in the sense that it resonated with comedians themselves because they felt it hit the mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can we talk about contemporary comedy for a minute? Sure. Um, so I'm curious what your, what your general impressions are of certain comics these days. Would you be willing to do that? Well, I will do it very delicately. I'm not I, oh. like I say. Even in my book, well, I don't. Then I say, don't want to do it. <laughs> even well, even in my book, I say I don't find, or I don't say that somebody's funny or unfunny in my book. So there's people in my book that I don't like. Well, how about we do people you admire? Sure. Who are the people you most admire now? Who are the who do you like the most now? Oh God! <clears throat> I know it's a boring question. Well, it's not. It's just a, you know I try not to say because it's uh, polarizing sometimes, and you lose credibility if. You, you, you choose the wrong person. Yeah, if you choose somebody other people don't like or that they do like. Yeah, but that's, that's So the most uncontroversial answer that's I give. That's what's interesting, Cliff. Come on. Yeah. No, the most <laughs> uncontroversial answer I always give when I do like NPR and they ask me that question is Mel Brooks. Oh. Because he is universally beloved and he is an anomaly. Most comedians, yeah. as they get older, become less funny to young people or just in general, they start to become out of touch like – Anybody who ages does, you become more out of touch with young people. Mel Brooks somehow has remained truly hilarious throughout his entire career, regardless of his age. You could argue that his movies weren't as good later years than earlier years, of course. But as a human being, to see him appear on Conan O'Brien, 
he still fucking brings down the house. Uh, yeah. He's in his 90s. Huh. He's still uh, ripping it up. So uh, to him, he's my one of my favorites as a human what being. What about him? So uh, when did Blazing Saddles come out? 74. So I saw it right when it came out, and I hurt from that. It was so mm-hmm. funny. It was mm-hmm. hilarious. I mean, it was really body you know, and in ways that I had never really seen before and no one had, of course. And it was just, it killed me. It was in the best way. So I'm a huge Mel Brooks fan um, because of that. But what about you? Like, what about his stuff? My introduction to Mel Brooks was Get Smart, even though he wasn't on it, but his okay. name in the credits. And he, was, I, he was a writer. Was he a writer? Co-creator and, uh, and writer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He, and Buck, he and Buck Henry have co-creator credit on Get Smart. Hmm. And Leonard Stern, who produced it, was a one of the main writers of Steve Allen's uh, comedy in the 1950s. So it was a very credible group. Buck Henry, who wrote The Graduate and sure. who starred in Taking Off, which was Milo Foreman's first English-speaking movie and, uh, uh, you know, so many great things in Mel Brooks. So it was just great comic minds were involved on Get Smart. And Get Smart is sort of like a typical 60s sitcom in terms of its format and its laugh track and its actors. But even as a six-year-old, I felt like it was a cut above I loved it. all other 60s sitcoms. It was, it was super smart. funnier and wackier. and uh, Cutting. Just, it was yeah. cutting. There was a wit that was intelligent and cutting. Yeah. Any shortcomings it has, it's because of the confines of the 60s sitcom format. You yeah. Know? Right. So it was an above average show. So that was my introduction to Mel Brooks. And then I saw him in the Muppet movie. <laughs> Oddly enough, I have to cre- credit the Muppets with introducing me to a lot of comedians because that was one of the shows they showed on CBC every day. Mm. My first experience with Steve Martin was as the host of the, uh, the Muppet show. And uh, Mel Brooks is, is appearing in the Muppet movie. And Richard Pryor, I think, was in the Muppet movie. So I learned about all those guys from, from, from that. And then for me, because of my generation, the Mel Brooks movie, which turned me on, is... Again, this comes to the idea of age, how there's a generational divide usually in comedy. The comedy that people in their 50s like is often very different from the comedy that teenagers like. And, you know, and you can pick any age group. My introduction to Mel Brooks was Spaceballs, hmm. which I thought was a hilarious, great movie at the age of six. And when I talk to anybody who's older than me, they all think it's one of the worst things Mel Brooks ever did. And for me and everybody my age, it was like, same way you felt with Blazing Saddles. Yeah. It was just this liberation of wacky hilarity, just goofy for goofy's sake. There's a character named Barf. There's a character named Pizza the Hut who's disgusting with cheese dripping off of him. And all these sort of just non sequitur jokes for the sake of jokes, combing the desert and all that stuff uh, was just so gratifying for a six-year-old. Here you have no story, no love story, just pure <laughs> comedy jokes for the sake of jokes and i had never seen star wars at that point in my life so it wasn't even like i was laughing at a satire of star wars um that's what turned me on to mel brooks in a big way and then when i was a teenager later that video store rio's videos i was able to rent silent movie and high anxiety and blazing saddles and young frankenstein and the 12 chairs which is his least uh, hmm. wacky hmm but yeah, so Mel Brooks, I know I'm skirting your question about modern no. comedians. No, that's good. But he is still, he's still alive, alive. Yeah. and he still makes people laugh. And when he appears on any late night talk show, he's great. He's a great American, period, I Mel, think. Mel Brooks is amazing. I had, right before my book came out, about a year before, I got to do a show with him uh, here in town when Sid Caesar died. I, just total bluster. I sort of ambushed Mel at, at the Conan O'Brien show. He was on the show. And a bunch of the writers who I know there invited me. Do you want to come watch Mel? I'd never met him. I said, yes, by all means. Do you want to hang out in the green room with him? I said, yes, by all means. So I got to meet him there. And I said, say, Mel, I sometimes put on shows at this theater here in town. We show screenings of old movies and stuff. And I know I said, Caesar just died. And I was wondering if you would attend a screening of this compilation film, 12 from your show of shows, best of Sid Caesar, if you would be willing to do an interview. And he goes, yes, yes. When, where, I'll bring people, yes. <laughs> I said, oh, well, I have to phone and then confirm that you'd do it and I'll let you know. And so, you know, I watched the Conan O'Brien taping and all that. And Mel said, yeah, I'll see you soon, blah, blah, blah. I phoned that theater. I said, hey, listen, do we have any openings on the schedule for this movie, your show of shows? I go, why? Because I just booked Mel Brooks for a show <laughs> that doesn't exist. <laughs> so they had to scramble and they found a copy of this movie at UCLA and we showed it and Mel showed up and... Hmm. I interviewed him on stage for an hour 
And with Mel, you don't have to ask any questions. You ask one question at the start and then say thank you at the end. He does the whole show. But it was just such an incredibly exciting experience for me to be on stage, just me and him, and to absorb his laughs that he was getting from the crowd was an interesting phenomenon. And to see him beforehand, hang out with him backstage for an hour talking, and to see how nervous he got right before he went on stage. Really? Yeah, that was really interesting. Uh, really? Right before we went on stage, an assistant came up from the theater and she goes, can I get you guys anything? Do you need some water? And Mel goes, vodka. And we laughed, but he was serious. He goes, no, I need a, get me a ginger ale with the shot of vodka too. You know, and really? so she did. And he was like nervous. And huh. he goes, uh, he goes, you're going to talk first and then bring me up. I go, yeah, I'll do like a little three minute intro. He goes, no, no, do five, do five. You know, <laughs> it was, uh, it was really interesting. And, um, because I know about a lot of that old timey stuff. Also, I could ask him stuff off stage. Like, you know, I heard that you were into Bora Minovich and his harmonica rascals. He goes, ah, oh, hilarious. They were just this musical comedy act from Fox movie musicals in the thirties. So yeah. we talked about old movies. Yeah. And I don't know like that. I'm rambling here, but for, did you do Shecky gray for him? No, you didn't get no, his, his opinion first, on this. You're the first person who's heard that since I think I've done stand up. I'm honored. But, uh, no, no. But if, that for me is just, I guess, I don't know. Well, you're, you're a boy from the woods in an isolated rural area with one TV channel, and then uh, you're on stage with Mel Brooks. That's, you've you know, come a long way. It's like a meaningful... You've come a long, you know, long The LSD teaches you long way. the spiritual meaning of things. And for me, it was like a spiritual thing. Here's this beautiful uh, full circle. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, I think I'm done with you. All right. I think we're good. Thank you so much for this. My pleasure. And um, everyone should go get the book. It's called The Comedians. Cliff Nesteroff, otherwise known as Shecky Gray. And uh, I hope to see you around doing more stuff. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Thank you. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To support the show and become a member of the Unregistered community, go to unregisteredlisteners.com. To purchase any of the Renegade University video courses or to sign up for the weekend in New Orleans with me, go to ThaddeusRussell.com slash courses.